and I'm late, like always. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the concept or the feeling that salt water is too hard. I wanted to get into that. I actually had an interview on a different YouTube channel two days ago about this topic, and I thought, why don't we talk about it on my channel as well? I mean, this is actually something that you do hear from time to time, and there's a number of reasons why. So, as you guys trickle in here, we make sure the audio is working properly and that everything's working on YouTube. We will uh, get going on this. First, there's Amar. You're the first. Okay, you're the only one here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late. <clears throat> Hi, Andrea. Lisa's here too. Good. Okay, so far we have some people. Now we need to just make sure that I'm not too loud, that I'm the right strength. I feel like it's turned up too high. And turn this down a little bit and hopefully not make things difficult for you to hear. So now we got to wait another 20 seconds before you can tell me it's okay. Hi, Hernando. What are you doing here? Are you out there chasing Pokemon still? Brennan's Reef is here. Kyle is here. Kyle, are you actually from Glasgow or is that your last name? Hi, Hillbilly Reefer. All right, so let's throw the phrase on the screen. The phrase that pays. You remember that one? Probably not. All right, so salt water is too hard. That is the saying that you oftentimes hear when people are interested in potentially getting a saltwater aquarium. They're told by everyone, oh, it's too hard. It's too hard. It's much too hard. Uh, it's impossible. That's why I don't even recommend it. Don't do it. You know, there's a lot of that negativity. And then there's some people that will say, oh, it's too hard. Well, then I want to do it because I want to conquer that. And then there's others like, oh, it's too hard. Never mind. I won't do it. Or they will say, I thought about it 10 years ago, but everyone said it was too hard. So I just never tried it. So why is it called too hard? I wanted to delve into that. I wanted to find out if we can maybe, I mean, it's not a myth, but it's not a truism either. I mean, clearly there are a lot of people that have saltwater aquariums. Uh, I was going to do some math. Let me see if I can do it on my little calculator here. Probably not, but we'll try it anyway. That looks like three, <laughs> three, three, oh, 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 divided by, oh, I'm doing this wrong, 100,000 divided by three, three, oh, 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 equals. Okay, if it's, if my calculator didn't lie, because that was too many zeros, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to assume that less than 1% of people in the United States have a saltwater aquarium. And that's saying there's 330 million Americans and there's 100,000 saltwater tanks. Maybe the number's higher. But I do know the saltwater is like a tenth of freshwater. So there's a ton of fresh... I guess we do the freshwater and find out whatever the number there is. We can just take 10% of that and say that's saltwater. So maybe it's 200,000. You know, I don't know that it's a million aquariums that are saltwater in the United States. I really don't know. But it is a small number, and there's a reason why there's a small number. And usually it has to do with not that it's too hard, but that it costs so much or you, you lose things. So let me just kind of jump right into this and uh, quit dallying around. First thing you have to consider when you're starting a saltwater tank is you have to know what you're doing. And so if you don't know what you're doing, you start buying things and throwing solutions at the problem as they arise, and your tank becomes kind of an ongoing nightmare, and you can never seem to get it to that point that you thought would be so easy to set up. So you see, we are kind of dealing with easy versus hard, but what I've always advised everyone is instead of buying anything, Learn as much as you can before you spend the first dollar. If you listen to that advice and you don't buy anything as you keep reading and learning and studying and watching YouTube videos and doing all those things, then when you're finally ready to start doing it, you have some base knowledge. I remember I was talking with Richard Ross a couple of years ago on this channel, and we talked about the idea of people getting certification to run an aquarium. Basically, sort of like you need to get certified to drive a car. You earn a driver's license. You have to take classes. You have to pass a test. Someone has to come with you and verify that you're gonna drive safely and boom, you get your learner's permit or you end up getting your driver's license. Well, we're not talking about that extreme, but if people 
were learning rather than impulse buying, they would have a better successful story. And the fact that people buy things impulsively, and I'm, I'm the same way, I might say, oh, I want this right now. By buying something impulsively, you're kind of going in blind, you're hoping it's all going to work out, you think, well, I, I spent my money correctly, but at the same time, what ends up happening is you don't know what you're doing, and so things start going wrong, and you keep trying to solve those problems with any advice you can, you can scrounge up. So you could be on a, a saltwater forum, you could be using a Facebook group, you could be talking to the fish store, you could be talking to friends or uh, you know, relatives that had aquariums, you know, 20 years ago, and you could say, hey, what did you do for this? And, you know, the advice may not be accurate. It, it could be actually really wrong. <laughs> and so you try that advice. It's not working. You see the money you spent so far. You start adding it up in your head. And you start thinking, wow. This is getting out of control. I can't keep throwing money at this problem. I'm just going to cut my losses. And so then you walk away from it and you tell others, yeah, that was really hard. And so they believe you. <laughs> they, they, they believe you because, number one, you sound like a person that has experience. You've lived it. And number two, they don't know the backstory of your lack of knowledge without being insulting. I'm just saying, you know, once you know a lot more, you're gonna have a much greater chance of success than you would going in blindly. And we don't wanna go in blindly at all. We wanna go in, we wanna have a game plan, we wanna have a schedule, we wanna have a routine. And if you do all these different things, you can actually have success in having a saltwater aquarium. Now for me, when it comes to saltwater, I'm thinking about a saltwater reef aquarium, which is a step beyond just having an aquarium filled with salt water and some fish swimming around some rocks. That to me is, you know, kind of boring. I, I'm a big coral guy, so I would take it a step further, which makes it a little bit more difficult. And again, it comes down to getting the knowledge to handle those difficulties and hopefully avoid them. So think about any aquarium you've ever gone to visit, a public aquarium. They have a curator, they have a person that's in charge of the marine department, and then they have a bunch of employees. And when they hire new employees, what's the first thing they teach all the employees? How to do stuff. How, to, how we test the water. How we change the water. How we clean the glass. How often do we clean the glass? How often do we test? <laughs> how often do we change the water? See, I mean, there's that. There's also, you know, you gotta be in uniform. You've gotta be professional. You have to have a cool demeanor. You can't get angry easily. You know, I mean, these are some logical things, right? Then how do we handle this species of animal how do we handle that species of animal? This is all in a public aquarium environment. You coming home with an aquarium and just filling it up with water that you know that you either took out of the sink or you purchased, you know, from the fish store or you bought jugs of water from a water machine or you literally used RODI water, which is reverse osmosis deionized water to create your first batch of salt water. And then you put in that first thing you really wanted, which was a puffer fish or a lionfish or a grouper or a stingray or a small shark. And it just these different things because oh, I really want a shark. So you go buy all the ingredients and you put the shark in the aquarium and the shark doesn't make it. And you're thinking, well, what did what went wrong? And then, you know, people will say, well, what was your salinity? <laughs> or they'll say, you know, well, what was your temperature? And no one's asking, was the tank round on the ends? Because sharks shouldn't be in square boxes, basically. Uh, I mean, there's certain little nuances of that specific animal. What about the puffer? You can put a puffer in the tank. It acts like a puppy. It's super cute. You adore, it's adorable. It has huge eyes like E.T. And as you put food in, it chomps it up and leaves bits everywhere. And then you have this weird red stuff all over the sand bed. And you're like, what is this stuff? I don't understand. This wasn't here before. Who did this? And, you know, someone else could say, oh, I recognize that. That's cyanobacteria. Well, what's the solution? Can we clean a red cyano RX? And you're like, okay, and how do I do that? And they tell you how to do it, or you read the box, or you watch a video, and you put it in the tank, and then your puffer suddenly is covered in ick. And you're like, why is my puffer looking weird? It looks like there's snow on its body. And it's, well, it's sick. It had ick. Now you've got to do this with that fish. And you're thinking, wait, I'm still dealing with the red stuff on the sand. And now I got this other, I've got a fish disease I have to contend with. No one told me fish get sick. And so there's another thing on your list. And now they're saying, okay, you got to set up this quarantine tank. You've got to have low salinity. And you move this puffer fish in there. 
and you're trying to make sure it eats and you're trying to make sure it's not stressed and you're changing the water frequently so it won't die of ammonia poisoning. And in the meantime, the other tank, the red stuff seems to be fading because the lights went off overnight. You're like, oh, it's all better now. But it's not. It comes back the next day because it's photosynthetic. See, I'm explaining just two things that could be happening to a new hobbyist that just went out and bought a tank and a fish and uh, just went all in. But if you're reading about these things in advance, you can recognize them. And if you've got books <laughs> or if you're getting Coral Magazine, you can get a lot of good knowledge to create a base to lean into as you're starting your first aquarium. And then, of course, people say, well, I want all these different fish and I want to fill the tank up with fish. And they, they, they like the idea of it's just a fish swarming with fish. I mean, I'm sorry, an aquarium swarming with fish that looks like, um, you know, the New Year's Eve parade with all the confetti going everywhere and the confetti are the fish. And it's too many fish, and the aquarium can't support that am amount of fish, and the filtration can't handle it, and so you're told you need a sump. And you're like, what's a sump? And it's because you didn't get that initial knowledge. All right, let me take this thing off the screen because I want to put something else on the screen. How about this? Salt water is too expensive. I'm going to move this here a little bit higher. I'll put it up here. Um, is it too expensive? It is if you're having to buy things twice. So if you're buying things that you thought were good enough, but they're not quality, they're going to break sooner, and you've got to buy another one and another one and another one. That becomes expensive. Uh, if you are setting up a tank and the, the lack of knowledge is causing all kinds of issues to arise, you're going to keep implementing solutions that cost money, and it's going to become more and more expensive. And now, like, let's go back to the puffer that's covered in ick. You have to buy a second aquarium, a second heater, a second thermometer, a second hang-on-back filter, to end up maybe even a little simple light on top to put that fish in quarantine slash hospital tank. And so you've got it there, and you're buying some medication, and you're changing the water every single day, and you have to keep buying water because you don't have enough, because you don't have a water filtration unit at home. And so, again, this becomes expensive. You know, like, I just wanted a simple tank with a puffer, and all of a sudden I'm dealing with two tanks in my house, and I've got to have a barrel for salt water, and you're telling me I need to put in more water because of evaporation, so I keep putting in more salt water, and every time it evaporates, I put more salt water, and it gets more and more salty, which is the opposite of what we want, lack of knowledge. So the more you can learn, the less money you're going to spend because you're going to spend it wisely and you're going to avoid certain mistakes. So we'll go back to the puffer for a second. If the puffer was quarantined in the first place, there's less of a chance of a fish disease. Okay, And so you would set up a second tank in advance for your brand new acquisition. You bring it home. I would recommend putting it through a product called Safety Stop that costs $5. It takes you about two hours from acclimation to the end of the Safety Stop bath. And then you put it into the quarantine tank and you observe it for two to three weeks. Really, three weeks would be smart. And all we're doing, we're not medicating it, we're just observing it. And if no weird thing crops up in three weeks, you can put it into your aquarium and it can live there and be happy. And if you do that with every new fish you buy, you'll avoid an issue. But if you take the brand new puffer, you, you, they scooped it out in a net, they put it in a bag, you came home, you drip black and what? Drip acclimated it for three hours because you read that on the internet, which is, by the way, wrong. And then you leave it, and then you put it straight into the aquarium, and then phew, it's covered in white snow. And you learn that that's called ick. Now you've got a tank that's got ick, and you've got a fish that's got ick. So you got to take the fish out and put it in that second tank I was talking about. And you have to leave the main tank fishless or fallow for six weeks. Now you've got this empty box of water in your house. It goes back to the saying, this hobby is too hard. This hobby is too expensive. I'm having to buy double. <laughs> and we don't want to make it more difficult. We, we, the industry is here to sell you products, yes. I sell products too. But I don't necessarily try to cram products down your throat. If anything, I tell you, stop buying things, stop plugging things in. Let's get down to the basics, which is going to be circulation, water quality, uh, good lighting, and uh, then, you know, you can kind of expand out from that core if everything's going well. And you can add one more new thing. And 
I'm talking about new piece of equipment, not livestock. Now, if we go to the other idea, the other extreme, uh, the confetti fish, you fill the tank up with all these fish because you love them. You're like, oh, I bought myself 30 clownfish because I just love clownfish. And you put them all in, I don't know, a 40-gallon breeder. Well, if they're little babies, that's totally fine. But if they are decent sized, that is going to be a combined bio load that's going to affect the filtration. And the tank can't handle that much waste from that many fish. Plus, you have to feed all those fish, which, which creates more waste. And the waste raises uh, the ammonia level, which has to convert to nitrite, which has to convert to nitrate. You're doing these water changes, trying to keep it under control. Your tank is so young and immature, it can't handle such a load. It could have handled two clownfish, no problem. And then after a few weeks, it could add. you could add a royal grama. You know, you could add a... Uh, um, Pajama cardinal fish, Bengay cardinal fish, um, maybe some you know, purple pseudochromus. I don't know. I mean, you just add things gradually. And then after a few more weeks, you add another fish. And then finally, you get to some point where, I don't know, you've got you've amassed a total of nine or ten fish, and you kind of stop there. You don't need confetti. You need nine or ten healthy fish that are eating the food and swimming around and keeping you entertained and allowing you to take care of these beautiful animals because they are literally your pets. The only difference between this pet and another pet is you can't take it out and literally pet it. <laughs> you can't just hug it and, and love on it. Uh, normally we just get to create a really nice ecosystem for them. And I guess the best way to compare it, well, I'm comparing with lack of knowledge, but I'm comparing it to like one of those um, terrariums that has a, uh, the little tree frogs in it. You know, I don't really think people are petting frogs, right? They're probably not. They're probably enjoying them, and they're putting in crickets to feed them or, or mealworms or whatever they do, and they just keep the front clean so they can enjoy looking at them, but they're not hugging them like they might a dog or a cat, or they might have a bird that they stroke, or they have a turtle that they hold in their hand, or, you know, some other pets. But these fish are still our pets, and we should literally be looking at them as a finite resource because... If you buy a fish, the idea is that you're going to keep that fish for 5, 10, 20, 30 years. Some fish live a very long time. Some have a shorter lifespan. And you can research these fish that you'd like and find out how long they're, they're typically going to live to have an idea how long you're going to be taking care of this animal for its lifespan. If you uh, are buying fish and they're dying and you're buying fish and they're dying and you're buying fish and, you're, and they're dying, you keep taking from, quote unquote, the ocean. And we don't want to do that because there's only so many in the ocean. We want to care for those that we've acquired as if they're the last fish on Earth, if they're the last coral. You know, that's kind of how I used to look at things. If I had a hammer coral in my aquarium that wasn't doing well, I thought, well, what if this is the last one on the planet? And my job is to keep that coral healthy and happy. That that's a it's a, a, a thought process that is worthy of consideration. It's a little extreme, and we're not at that point, but if we keep things in mind in that way, we will do better in taking care of our aquariums. So, let's say you have purchased your aquarium, and you already think it's hard, and you already think it's expensive, now what do we do? Well, keep learning. Learn as much as you can. Read as much as you can. But also, when you, if you're reading forums, or you're reading Facebook groups, or you're reading Discord, or wherever it is you're going for information, there will be one person asks a question, and you'll see 10 to 20 different answers. And I always laugh when I see that. I mean, you know, laugh internally. I'm not, like, laughing at the person. I'm laughing at the scenario. My, how do I heat up my water has 20 different answers. And so I want to ask them, now, which of those answers are you going to go with? Because they all sound legitimate. <laughs> to, a, to a person that has no knowledge, it all sounds plausible. Which is the cheapest? You know, which is the easiest? Uh, which can I do right this minute? Uh, which re requires me not to go to a store and buy something or wait for something to show up from Amazon? And so they try this, they try that. Not all the advice you get is going to be good advice. And a lot of times I, I, well, I've always done it this way. When I was looking for advice, I always looked at the person's aquarium because that was their business card. And if I saw their reef and I didn't like the way it looked, I would think I'm not really trusting their advice so much. And that's a real a uh, real person, real world way of looking at things, in my opinion, because 
getting advice from someone that has a terrible tank seems like you will replicate the same problem. You'll have a terrible tank too because you're not shooting for A++. And if you are trying to mimic someone that has this stellar aquarium, odds are they've been through a lot, they have a lot of knowledge, and they can probably help you through whatever issue you're, going, you're dealing with. And you'll be able to uh, you know, resolve that and get back on track and start getting closer to copying them one day. So I wanted to get into this because I feel like sometimes we just need to be reminded that there is an a, a, uh, education level that needs to be mastered. Now, as you learn things and you become more knowledgeable about something, that doesn't necessarily make you the expert on that topic. And some people will type things as an answer and it comes across as a, an absolute, this is the way to do it, nothing else works, whatever I told you to do, you should be doing it. And that kind of advice kind of can be scary too. You know, to me even, as a reader, I'm just like, oh, because they're using absolutes. And you'll notice a lot of times in my channel, see, I didn't say all the time, uh, I would say I recommend this or I think this, but there's a possibility of that because there's always nuances, there's always gray areas, there's always certain things we don't know about the situation. So for me to just say, here's your answer, boom, you're without knowing the whole backstory of your aquarium, I could be giving you advice that doesn't fit your situation, or it could be advice that only works based on the original question with no extra information considered. So we want to make sure that we have a really good understanding of the situation. We want to make sure that the answers make sense. We want to double check their answers. Maybe look at the product they're talking about, read about that product, see if you can learn more about it and see what, I mean, and that would even delve into the reviews of the product to kind of just kind of get a good bird's eye view of this situation. And then let's say the advice was to use product XYZ so you get the product, you're not sure how much to use, you try to do the math, math is hard, and then you just you think, well, it says use this much. Well, you don't always have to use the full amount. You can sometimes lower the amount to a smaller number and maybe do half a dose today and half a dose tomorrow, or half a dose today and half in two days. And that way you become the full strength, but you don't overdo it. Now, people with tons of experience, people like Dwayne, uh, he had a problem recently with his calcium reactor. He was trying to solve it, and his, his alkalinity was dropping. He went to the Reef Chemistry Calculator, which is an online uh, uh, browser-based uh, calculator where you can put in your total gallons, the product you want to use, the number you're at right now, the number you want to be at, and it spits out, you need this many teaspoons. And so in his case, I think it was 18 teaspoons, and he started with eight. And I guess the number didn't bump, so he put in the rest of it, and then the number shot way up. And I never did get you know more information about it, but even someone with a lot of experience can overdose a product. It's possible. We all can. Every one of us can do it. I've done it too. So if you're using half the dose, and then you wait, and you you know check on it 20, 30 minutes later or the next day, and you see where it's at, you can always put some more in. It doesn't have to be all done at once. And that can avoid losses, and losses equal money. <laughs> and if you lose your stuff overdosing in your tank, and you have to buy new of those fish, we're back to the salt water is too expensive thought. Now, let's talk about what is expensive. The, the entire hobby is expensive, but you can control some of those costs by buying used setups. Now, when you get used, you get a lot of gear, usually at 50% of what retail was, ideally. And so you get to save some money. You get to look forward at how you're, uh, you're not spending so much money. You know, like let's say you wanted a 100-gallon tank and you went to the fish store and said, how much is a 100-gallon tank? And they came back with the aquarium is, I don't know, $800. And the stand is going to be $1,200. So now you're looking at 2000 for just those two things. And then you happen to see an ad and someone's selling their 90-gallon aquarium with everything. And it's only 600 bucks. And you're like, wow, that's going to save me all kinds of money. So you go buy everything, and it comes with rock, it comes with sand, it comes with lights, it comes with um, some fish, it comes with some snails, it comes with disease, it comes with pests. <laughs> I mean, these are things you're going to also get because you're getting a deal. You're not starting from scratch. So you may have to deal with some of these situations. 
Or you may say, well, I really just want all the, the hardware. And I want the glass box and the stand. I don't really want all the disaster that's inside of it, which is a valid concern. And you decide how you want to handle that, whether you give it to a fish store for, fish, for store credit, you sell that livestock to someone else. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's your homework. That's what you have to figure out. But you can save money buying things used. Also, you can save money buying things online. And that can be of benefit to your wallet. But you shouldn't do it to the extreme to where you never buy anything from your local fish store. Because you do want the local fish store to be open when you need some products in a hurry. So if something breaks, you break the heater, you break your, your um, hydrometer or your refractometer, you just drop it and it just shatters. You don't want to wait two or two days or five days to get the replacement in the mail. You want to just run up to the store and get it really quickly and be able to measure your salinity because it matters. Or you broke your heater, you got to heat the tank because it's going to be cold tonight and you have to get a replacement. Well, if they're out of business because you only bought online, that's on you. That's not on them. They're trying to stay in business. You're choosing not to shop with them. So supporting the local fish store at least, at least part of the time should be part of your hobby experience. Plus, you get to the opportunity to see things in person. You get to see animals. You get to see uh, you know, the fish, the shrimp, the uh, feather dusters. Uh, you might see nudibranchs. You might see um, all kinds of coral fragments for sale. I mean, there's lots of stuff. And while you're in there, you're learning through osmosis because you're in the room. You're, you're seeing things and how they're set up. You can kind of see how their sumps are set up. You can see where they, if they're using a controller of any kind. Do they like a certain brand of controller? Do they have thermometers everywhere? You know, what are they doing to handle rust? You know, how are they handling the decay of the building? Because you don't want your home to decay around your aquarium because of the saltwater environment. I mean, these are just little tiny nuances, but they all matter in the end. It's not all about the glass box. So we want to make sure that we're learning and talking and making friendships with the fish store if you can, because later on when you need a favor or it's an emergency, it's really good if they're your friend and not just a place of business. Also, um, if you d create that friendship, if there is an emergency late in the night, you may be able to call them on the phone and say, this is happening, and they'll take your call because you're friends. So, you know, it would be worth being buddies and not being hostile toward them and thinking they're out to get you because they're not. They want to make a living so they can eat and have a roof over their heads too, but they have to earn the money, okay? So you, you can't just hold that against them. If you might say, well, they're charging way too much for this, then don't buy that thing. But there's other things you can buy to support them, and that way they'll be there to help you as you're going through your hobby experience. Um, now, there are certain things you should definitely buy, and having a, an aquarium that you can trust would be my number one choice because a, an aquarium with a warranty is a wonderful thing. And buying used, you don't get a warranty. Now you're just going to have to hope that it holds water for the next six years or whatever. And it may. It might live. It, it, yeah, it might live. It might live 12 more years or it might burst a seam in six months. You just never know. So if you get a tank with a warranty, hopefully you'll be better suit, You'll be better off and you'll be okay and you won't be buying another replacement tank anytime soon. But uh, and in the situation of buying gear with warranties, I like to buy new. And I also like to buy backups of gear. So if I have three heaters for my aquarium, I would have a fourth heater in the closet in case one breaks or fails. So I can just put another one in there and my tank continues to operate and has no idea it ever had a hiccup. So that's how I do it. And sometimes buying things in groups saves you money because of bulk purchases. And this can work in buying bulk carbon or buying salt in bulk, maybe. I mean, I'm just throwing these things out there. If they don't work in your area, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> the, Back in the day, a lot of times we did things called group buys in our clubs. And if you can become a member of a club, that can be enormously helpful. Number one, you got club members that are willing to help each other. Number two, they also, they also, it's a great source for buying used products and used livestock. You know, <laughs> used. Uh, you could buy someone else's fish because it, it outgrew their tank, but it'll totally fit your tank because your tank is bigger. Or um, they're selling fragments of their corals because they have too much of something and you don't have any of it. So you could buy it from them. So there's a benefit to being part of a club. But uh, if you 
have that club relationship that you can, I, I feel like I, I went off track and lost my train of thought. Let me think. Yeah, I lost it. Sorry, it's gone. But if it comes back to me, I'll, I'll just say, oh yeah, and I'll say it. <laughs> but if we if you can be part of a club and you can reap some of those benefits, you can also have friendships there that you can reach out to in the case of needing help. Yeah, I totally lost that train of thought. It is not coming back. I lost it. Here, let me change the background. This is too boring, right? What if we go with this? There we go. Um, okay. Back to our phrase of it being too expensive. I lost my little thingy. Oh, I see. It just vanished. Sorry, I'm thinking, but I, I just can't seem to get back my thought I had. <laughs> I got one. Put this guy up here. So another expense that can happen with your saltwater aquarium that you might be shocked with compared to freshwater is the fact that all the fish cost so much money. And fish can be, some are inexpensive. They're usually boring fish that most people don't want. And then when you want something really nice, like a certain type of tang, it could be hundreds of dollars. And that could be because they're, because like I said, they're finite. There's not an unlimited supply to where you can just keep scooping them out of the ocean. There are also some that are hybrids that have been tank raised and been, you know, like there's the Yurple, which is a yellow tang that was bred with a purple tang to create this combination tang that has no purple and has no yellow. It's just kind of this weird gray look, but it's so rare that it sold for $7,500, okay? And there's someone that owns the Yurple. And other people thought, oh, that's so neat to have. That is not my choice. I would want the purple tang. And purple tangs, you know, 10 years ago were probably, I'm going to assume they were about 100 bucks. Nowadays, it could be $300. It could be $350. <laughs> it, it just, it's crazy what fish cost these days. But part of the cost that you're seeing it's not that the fish is expensive, it's the transportation. Getting it from point A, which is the ocean, all the way into your aquarium, there's a lot of pit stops along the way, and those rides in airplanes cost money, and then they go into a facility where they have to treat them and make sure they're healthy enough to sell to a fish store, and then they get on another plane and go to that fish store, and so hundreds of dollars was added to the cost of shipping the fish. Listen, I bought three fish from Hawaii years ago, three flame angels, and they were juveniles. They're really cute. There was a picture of three in the person's hand. I said, I want those. And I bought them. And I paid overnight shipping from Hawaii to here. I don't remember what it was. It was hundreds, right? And when I opened the box, one was already dead. It was already dead. It died during transit. I was so sad. So I'm down to two. And then after a matter of, I don't know, I feel like it was a matter of two weeks or so, the second one died. And I was like, wow, I spent a lot of money for one fish. Now, that is exactly what happens to a fish store. And I'm not trying to rain uh, negative thoughts down on the fish stores, but the reality is when they order in fish, they don't open the box and everything's alive and healthy and happy and ready to go, and they can just put them in tanks and sell them. They experience dead-on-arrival losses. And that price is factored into the total price of the fish. And then if the fish store gets credit for a couple of fish that didn't make it, where it came from, they don't just give it to them like a warranty replacement. Like, oh, yeah, no problem. Here's two more fish. We'll fix it. You still got to pay for the hundreds of dollars of shipping to bring in two more. So what ends up happening is the fish store gets a, a credit on that order of maybe $56 <laughs> or some small amount. And then they are basically pressured into buying $800 or $900 worth of fish to justify the shipment of this overnight shipping, which could be $200 or so, and they receive the box and a couple don't make it again. And this process never ends. This is exactly why I don't run a fish store. The fact that I would open a box and it's not alive would hurt my feelings too much. 
And I could not look at that as the cost of doing business. I can't do it. And I'm going to compare this to something that's way more easy to resonate with. If you were to order 10 puppies for your pet store and you open the box and nine were alive and one was dead, what would you think? Okay. I always compare it to puppies because everyone loves puppies. <laughs> but that's the thing. We don't have a guarantee that all of them are going to arrive alive. Just like if I order directly and I have them come to me, they don't all guarantee arrive alive. And I could say, yes, the guy in Hawaii owes me a flame angel or two, but the cost of shipping, it's like, forget it. I'm going to appreciate the one I have, the one survivor. Ideally, I would have loved to have had the harem of three and my tank swimming around because it would be really, really cool. It just didn't work out. The luck was not in my favor. So that one flame angel became very expensive to me personally because I paid for three plus shipping and ended up with one. So that can be a part of saltwater is too expensive. You have to decide, is the cost worth having it in your home? But for me, this video that you're looking at right now of my reef, and this is not an old video. It, I mean, it's a few weeks, but I mean, it's not like from 2010. This is basically what my reef looks like. I haven't shot a new piece of footage yet to share on the stream, but I'm growing corals. I have some fish in there. I love my tank. I don't overpopulate it. My father actually says you decorate the reef with a few fish, and he's not wrong because I want a few healthy fish in my tank rather than to keep fighting fish disease because I'm trying to add more and more fish. That is a way to just keep making things more expensive and more difficult for yourself, and there's no need to make your life difficult. Instead, I'm all about the corals. Corals, if, if even a speck of it survives, I can grow more from that speck. And that's kind of, you know, I mean, that's, it's not reincarnation. <laughs> <laughs> it's not resurrection. It's just life finds a way. So if you completely lose something to where it's just a dead skeleton, yes, you remove it from the tank. But if there's any bit of life left, there's a chance it can regrow and become beautiful again. That's that's why I like reef tanks so much. Now, corals can be very, very expensive depending on your taste. Uh, if you go in with the attitude, I don't want to pay for high dollar corals. I just want pretty corals that cost me 20, 30 bucks each. You look for those deals and you'll find them. If you go to events like frag swaps or club events or uh, to shows like Aquashella, Macna, Reefa Palooza, I mean, these are just some examples. And of course, going to the fish store and you can see the racks of corals and you can say, well, where's the $5 rack? And you just look at those. Is there anything in the $5 rack you kind of like that you could tolerate, that you could enjoy growing out? Sure. And that one thing, that one polyp of zoanthid, could become 30 in six, you know, six months, nine months, a year, and you have this nice little colony that grew from one little bit of life. And that part can be very, um, I can't think of the word. It's so close. My brain is so bad today. Um, rewarding. And that, I mean, I put in 20 little frags last year into Caitlin's Reef, a little 27 gallon aquarium, of zoanthids mostly and I and you know when you look at the tank you don't really see them growing it's not like a bouquet that just gets you know full of flowers it's you have the the four or five you glued in a spot and if you keep looking you'll notice hey there's seven or eight there oh there's nine you know okay cool well that tank's been running almost a year this May will be a year and we're March so we're 10 months right now and actually the rocks have quite a few polyps on them there's some areas that are very dense there's some others where they they're grow less quickly, and usually the prettiest ones grow the slowest. And they, are, they tend to be the ones that die first. So if you say, I have to have Acropora, and I have to have a home wrecker, or I have to have a Walt Disney, or you say, I've got to have a Colorado Sunburst, or whatever nickname they've got for a certain type of anemone that's just vivid, that's typically the thing that doesn't live when things go wrong. It's, it goes first. It's very unfair. You know, you would hope that the garbage stuff you don't care about dies, but the one that costs you a fortune will be the one thing that is a bright, shining star in your aquarium. But that's typically not how things work. You'll have um, the most expensive fish die because of a power outage, but you'll have like a damsel you started the tank with that's super hardy, it completely survives the ordeal and acts like nothing ever happened. And you're down to this damsel. <laughs> and that can be very frustrating. And you could say, well, look at, cumulatively, I lost all this livestock 
that added up to this many dollars, so this hobby is too hard. No, it's not too hard. Something bad happened because you weren't prepared for what if something goes wrong, which should be part of your whole hobby experience. And so that's why I was talking about buying backups of things and having extras of equipment. You know, it used to be if you went into a fish store and you said, I want this pump, they'd say it's $112. Now, this is a long time ago, right? $112, you're like, wow, that's a lot of money. And then you find out if you buy that pump online, it's 60 bucks. So instead, I would go buy two pumps online for the price of the one pump in the fish store, and I put one on the shelf, and I put one in my tank. And that way, if the one in the tank broke, I had a backup. didn't cost me any money. But to buy it for 112 at the fish store and then buy it again for 112 that seemed like a waste of money. Well, prices have equalized more because of so much online shopping, and stores are trying to come closer to those prices. So it's not... The, the uh, distance between online and in the store is not so huge anymore like it used to be. Oh, I remember what it was about clubs. See, I told you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we used to do things called group buys. And we would say, hey, guys, I want to buy a PAR meter. And they're really expensive. And then I got to pay for shipping. And I hate that. Does anyone else want to buy a PAR meter with me? And you might get five or ten people to say, yes, I want to buy a PAR meter. And then everyone buys the PAR meter. In a group buy, it's shipped to one location, and then everyone just goes to that guy's house and picks up their product, and they saved on shipping. Now, that's just you know a simple, generic example I could come up with. I actually did such a group buy with my friend Evan years ago on my other on a, a podcast I used to do called Reef Reefcast. And I was going to say Reef Trace. <laughs> and on Reefcast, we did this group buy, and we ended up having a 112 or 115 power meters sold in a matter of like two weeks. And we had... Everything lined up with the company. They said, okay, yeah, just go ahead and tell us how many you sold. And when we called them, we said, well, we sold 115. And they're just like, what? And they were nice enough not to ship 115 of these to me for me to mail it to everyone, because that was my plan. I was just going to reship it. No big deal, right? Just help out the hobby. But the company says, we'll just ship them directly to each customer, which I thought was amazing. And it took them a couple of weeks to fill that order because it was such a huge order, but it was a group buy. A more logical group buy in the clubs back in the day was to order in cleanup crew in bulk. And we would order in 800 critters. And that would go to like 15 people. And we would order peppermint shrimp and emerald crabs and tr uh, tro well more astrea snails and blue leg hermits and urchins and maybe a few serpent starfish because somebody had to have one. And all that stuff arrived in a box. And then you would post on the forum, it's all here, come get your goodies today. And then your job would be to sort them into bags, and then when they showed up, you'd hand them their bag of goodies, and that was the end of it. I mean, it was a really nice way to save money because overnight shipping was 90 bucks for a box of these critters. And if you could divide that by 15 people, it's like each person paid $4 in shipping. It was totally worth it. Well, our group buys were epic. They were ginormous group buys where we would order in two, three, four thousand critters. And it got to the point where the company that was bagging up everything they couldn't take care of regular customers. They literally had to take an entire day for DFW Mass, which is my club, to pack an order of 4,000 critters. And then they wouldn't even bag them individually, which made it so easy for me originally. Like, there was a bag of 25 of this. There was a bag of 50 of this. They said, we can't do that. Your orders are too big. It's too much work. We're just going to fill a giant bag with snails, and you can separate them when you, get, when you receive your order. And that's what I did. I covered my kitchen table with a piece of plastic. I poured all the snails on the table, and I went 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and filled a Ziploc bag and wrote the person's initials and put it in a cooler. And then I went 2, 4, 6. <laughs> and I, once I was done with the snails, then I had to do the hermit crabs. After I was done with the hermit crabs, I had to do the serifs. After I was done with the serifs, then I had to figure out who got emerald crabs and who got this. And I'm, I'd end up with 10 or 15 of these supermarket bags with the person's name on it in a cooler, and I'd be on everyone's case, get over here today, get your stuff, don't make me wait, do not wait till tomorrow, <laughs> come get your stuff. But it was, we had these huge uh, group buys and group buys were fantastic. And you know, these days with Amazon and everything being ordered online, some of the costs you can handle, but you might still say, hey, I wanna order a fish from Live Aquaria, but I really hate that shipping is this much. Does anyone else need something from Live Aquaria that lives near me? And you might be able to split the shipping and you both get a fish shipped to one address and you know, it cuts the price in half. So that's another way to save some money in this hobby and not make it so expensive. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the next very important thing 
about keeping the price of your tank under control because you're going to have maintenance of this aquarium week after week, month after month, year after year, and you can't neglect it. But if you do neglect it, if you don't do the normal things you were doing originally, the tank will gradually get worse and worse and worse. And then when it's time to solve the problem, it's going to cost you a lot of money to fix the problem. So when we first get a tank, we are really good and diligent about testing our water frequently. We're testing it nonstop. We're watching how the cycle works. Or we've added livestock. We're watching closely to make sure that the water parameters are staying in, in good shape. We're watching the reaction of any little coral fragments we put in the tank. We're seeing how the fish are acting and how they're swimming, how they're behaving. And we're totally immersed in it. But like a new car that you wash every week, after a while you stop washing every week. And now you're doing it every two weeks. And then you're doing it like once a month. And it's like, eh. I haven't washed in about two months, but I'm going to do it this weekend. But if I wash it, then it's going to rain, so maybe I shouldn't. And you put it off, and the next thing you know, it's been six months since you cleaned your car. Okay? Same exact thought happens with your aquarium. You sit there and you think, it's doing fine. I don't need to do that water change this week. Or I don't need to test the water because everything looks normal and nothing's changed. I've just been putting in pellet food all week, so it's fine. That thought process is the opposite of success. When you just say everything's fine and you're not being vigilant, then things will go wrong. Now, back to the movie Titanic that goes all the way back to 1912. They had a ship going full steam ahead across the frozen waters of the ocean. And they had two guys up in a crow's nest that were looking ahead for icebergs. And the idea was if they saw one, they would relay it back to the guy at the wheel and tell him to turn to avoid it. Well, we all know how that story went. They couldn't turn it fast enough, and it slammed into the iceberg, and the ship sank, and everyone died. Same thing with your aquarium. If you're testing your water weekly, even if you don't like doing it, it's just your job. If you do it weekly, you will steer the tank away from disaster because you see it coming sooner. If you only test once in a blue moon, or when things are really wrong, now you're in damage control. Now you're triaging the tank. You're trying to solve what went wrong when really what went wrong was you weren't doing your job for weeks or months. It happens to all of us. You become disinterested. Your life becomes complicated. Your, your, your job is eating up all your time. You're exhausted. You're sick. Whatever it is, there's always a reason. Your tank can begin to suffer from the neglect of not staying on top of it. And so I'm urging you to not let that happen to still dedicate one or two hours a week to your aquarium, which is not a lot to ask. If you're spending one to two hours a week, your tank should continue to do well. And if you're doing it really well, it will thrive, it will flourish, and it will look fantastic. <coughs> Last year, my tank had to regrow all these corals you see in the video right now. They all were planted as sticks. Some were a little bit bigger, a lot of them were small, and within 10 months or so, the tank looked like this. And people said, how did you do that? I was all on top of my testing, and I was also doing something new. I was dosing a ton of trace elements. I was trying to do something for a MACNA talk last September, and I was measuring my water with ICP testing every single week, and I was putting in trace elements that literally were showing not detected when they should have been detectable. There was not enough of certain things. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to replace them, replenish them, get them to the right volume so everything was at the same height as what the ocean will be. And I thought, if I can do that, I might have this amazing reef. And technically, I grew an amazing reef, and it didn't take super long. It doesn't take many, many years to get this look. Yes, that tank you're looking at is nine years old. It's going up, it's coming up on 10 this fall. But two years ago, I pulled out a lot of dead skeleton, a lot of undergrowth, and I planted corals in there, and it was going to be fine in nine months. However, something bad happened by salt mix. I lost a lot of the SPS corals, and I had to plant new ones, and I had to look at a lot of rock with twigs on it for a while, and it was kind of irritating. But I kept my eye on things. I was doing all these you know, extra things I hadn't done before, and it really grew in nicely. Then after MACNA, I gave my talk, and I just stopped doing the trace elements. I stopped doing all the CP testing, 
and I could literally see the tank become a little less vivid. I could see that the corals kind of stopped growing. They weren't dying, but they weren't really as robustly colorful, and I didn't really continue to see progress. I didn't see this growth continue to come out to the point where I have to keep cutting frags, right? And I attribute it to my lack of doing trace elements on a regular basis because of something I chose to do. And if I just kept doing it, I would probably have double the volume of the coral in there and I'd have to be cutting frags out constantly to allow to have proper flow in the aquarium. And so uh, about three weeks ago, I guess it is, I decided, okay, it's time to start getting back to my trace elements thing because I like it. And it's something different than I've done for the last uh, 26 years of the hobby. <laughs> it's something I embraced last year because it was something new to me that I'd never done before and I enjoyed it and it cost me a lot of money but I was choosing to spend that money. Someone else might say I don't want to spend any of that money like that I'd rather just do my water changes. And while water changes are considered or usually they say are the least expensive way to solve a problem turns out it's not quite as cheap as I thought. You know it just you, you think it's nothing. But if you're having to make the water and mix it with salt and you figure out what the salt costs you and you figure out what water costs you to make, you might find out, hey, a water change cost me 40, 50 bucks, depending on the size of what you're doing. It, if you've got a small tank and you're changing five gallons, it wasn't 50 bucks. But in my case, I'm changing 80 to 100 gallons at a time. I'm using 88 pounds of salt. You sit there and you say, well, how much did this barrel of salt cost me? How much is 88 pounds of it? And you do the math, like, okay, that was... $45 in salt I used today or something, you know, whatever it was. And then, you know, you you say I had to make 250 gallons of water. That's what I had to make. And you take the 250 and it costs you 3 cents per gallon. It's not terrible. 250 times 0 0.03. You know, $7.50. So you take my 45 plus my 750 and it's 5250 for a single water change. And people say, oh, I change water every single week. Well, if I did that, that'd be 200, you know, 200 plus per month. If I were to change it to a daily automated water change where I change seven gallons a day and I did seven times 30 days, that's 210 gallons. Um, I might be only in about a hundred bucks or so, 110. But for me, that's still a hundred dollars a month in water changes. Now, a few weeks ago, I did a live stream talking about the cost of electricity to run my reef tank and the fact that I have low electricity rates benefits me, but I have a huge aquarium and my electric bill for all my stuff was only $38 a month to keep it running because everything these days is low voltage, DC, LED, and so I'm not consuming a lot of kilowatt hours. If I lived in a place like California where the rates are crazy high, the same kilowatt hours would be very expensive for me in that state, but it's still cheaper than what it was 10 years ago with metal halides and magnetic driven pumps. Now, we didn't have DC-driven pumps. We didn't have LED lights back then like that. They were just getting started. Now they're the standard. So, you know, there are, you're going to save some money in that area, but there are going to be parts of this hobby that just are naturally expensive that you can't avoid, and you just have to decide, can I afford it? And that's a simple thing. When you go into a store and you're shopping, and you say, I want to buy a new sweater, and you're walking through the department and you're trying to find a sweater you like, then what do you do? You, you look at the sweater, you look at the tag, you're like, yeah, I don't want this one, you put it back. And you look for another one you like, and you find one that matches your budget, you're like, okay, I'm going to take this sweater, this works, I can afford it, I like it, I'm going to wear it. Same thing with corals. If you see a coral and you like it, you might say, oh my god, I don't care what it costs, I'm buying it, and you'll spend a lot. Or you might say, no, there's no way I'm spending that kind of money, and you walk away from it, and you pick something else out that you will like, that you can afford, that will not break the budget so your aquarium does not become too expensive. So I think that's kind of my topic for today. I've been ranting now for, <laughs> it wasn't a rant, uh, I've been talking for about 55 minutes now and I just felt like it'd be nice for someone, hopefully people that have never had a saltwater aquarium stumble on this video and they kind of get a little bit of insight on what to consider, but in the end it all boils down to knowledge. And the more you learn, the sooner you can learn it before you start actually bringing animals into the equation, the better off it's going to be for the livestock and for your wallet. And hopefully you'll continue to enjoy the hobby and you won't say it's so expensive and it's so hard to someone else. <coughs> All right, let me go to your questions. Let's 
let's see. Wow. Uh, a couple of my friends are putting on here that they still have snow. And we're going to be 92 degrees tomorrow and uh, or Monday and Tuesday. 10 inches of snow. Now that's beautiful. I love that. I think that's awesome. Let me stick that back on the screen again. Not because I care about snow, but I don't want it covering my face. <laughs> Jason, enjoy the snow. I hope you make a snowman and post a picture um, in Club Me Love Reef. I would appreciate that. Let me go ahead and remove this. And we'll go ahead. Uh, all my stuff I did in preparation have vanished because I was using the other thing. Oh well. My prep work is ruined! I'm just going to throw this on the screen here in the corner. This is Club Miller's Reef. This is a group that I created on uh, Facebook four years ago, I think. And we have about 9,300 members in there right now. The group is set up to let you share your tank with us and let us help you answer questions. Because I do answer questions on the live stream every single week, but there's seven days in a week. And there's all those other days when the question comes up, you can ask them in this group. You can tag me in there. You can tag Mila's Reef. You can tag Mark Levinson. And I will be help. I'll be happy to answer the question if I can. I also um, have moderators in there that can bring the thread to my attention in case I didn't see it. Or other people can chime in and help you. So, I mean, that's the nice thing about the group. It's a bunch of helpful people that want you to have a nice, pretty tank as well. So it's just facebook.com slash groups slash Milo's Reef. And I'm the one that personally approves each person uh, as the requests come in. Be sure you answer the questions uh, during the uh, application process because if someone doesn't even answer the questions, I hit delete. <laughs> it's just, if you can't even answer the three questions I asked, why are you joining this group? Do you want to ask questions? Well, so do I. So I ask you three. Let's see. Aw, Desert Elephant says, What's up, Mark? Watch or read all you can from this guy because he has answers that work. <laughs> it's true. Um, we, uh... We. Me. I have been documenting this hobby on my own website on milosreef.com for the last 20 plus years. Every time I came across something that just was being asked and answered a thousand times, I chose to write an article about it, and I put that article on my website. So if you're looking for a question, or if you have a question and you're looking for an answer, you can literally type into Google, <laughs> to Google or Bing or whatever search engine you use, um, how do I get rid of cyanobacteria and put the word Melev at the end, M-E-L-E-V. And that will literally take you to my article or my blog where I talk about it, or the product I sell because I sell things from my shop. Matter of fact, I'll throw that on the screen here because I need to make a living. <laughs> so milosreef.com sells all kinds of aquarium products, dry goods only. And these products are here to, they're the ones I use myself usually. And that's why I sell them because I've used them. I understand them. I like them. Uh, they've benefited my tank. I was like, well, if they're so good, I should sell them too. And so my, Originally, when I started my website, it was just education, and I started to sell RODI systems on one page of the website. And then later on, people said, well, you can build me a sump, and I ended up adding sumps to the website, and uh, I started doing more and more acrylic products. And in 2009, I made this my full-time business, and I literally sell aquarium supplies every single day of my life. It's always dry goods. I don't sell anything alive because I can ship things ground that way and not have to pay so much in shipping. I'm still paying for the shipping. <laughs> it's not free. I know you can go to certain websites and you get free shipping, and I'm sorry that I can't offer that to you. I would have to make a lot more money to afford to give away the shipping for free. A couple of years ago, I did the math, and I spent $10,000 in shipping of orders that went out to customers. Well, technically, the customers paid the $10,000, and I gave all that money to FedEx. Because <laughs> they bought whatever they bought, and then I put it in a box, and I packed it so it's safe. And then FedEx says it's this much money, which was almost always how much the customer paid. And uh, that got the product to the customer. I just can't afford to do free shipping at this time. And who knows, maybe one day I will be able to. But uh, if you have questions about products, if you have a hard time finding things, you can always reach out to me and ask me if I have it. But uh, there is a search box on the website where you can type in the product and it'll help you. Or you just type in the product in Google and put the word Mila's Reef on the end. And it will help you locate it on my website as well. Okay, let's go find us another question. 
Mahmood says, I need to replace a leaking bulkhead and want to redo my plumbing. Is it better to do all hard plumbing or some flex with it? I like all hard plumbing almost always. Uh, I just find that it's more structurally sound and all the pipes are guaranteed to be the same diameter all the way down, where with flexible tubing, it can kink or it can grow algae inside of it to where, because the lights on your sump area or your refugium could make algae grow in there and it obstructs the water flowing down the drain. Also, if you did have rigid PVC and then you switched to flexible tubing, you're going to have to put a hose barb on there. And if you look at the diameter of the hose barb, the hole is much smaller than the PVC pipe. Let's say you have one inch pipe going down to your sump. And then you put a fitting on there that goes from one inch to, I don't know, five eighths of uh, vinyl tubing. And then you have the large part of PVC that switches to the hose barb, which are the little, it's like a, a ridged nipple, and you press the tubing over it, the hole is so much smaller inside. And then you press the tubing over it, so you've got this restriction. Now, if something like a snail or even a fish somehow works its way down the drain, it could get stuck in that exact spot where the restriction is the smallest. So for me, I'm all about large diameter plumbing all the way down as best you can. Now, there are places where you can change a little bit, but I, I just, you know, just keeping a simple answer to a simple question, I would go with rigid all the way down. You can actually affix the plumbing to your sump to where it's supported, or you can use brackets to support it under the aquarium stand so that way the plumbing isn't yanking down uh, from water weight, you know, because gravity is pulling at all times. Yesterday, I worked on a tank in Dallas. It was a 550, no, 450 gallon aquarium that's been running for 12 years. And about nine years ago, he installed these overflow boxes that fit on the inside and have two bulkheads that go through the box to a box on the outside. And then it drains through the plumbing into the sump and the refugium and you know, all that stuff. Well, the box started to leak. And so we, I went there with the intent to replace the bulkheads <clears throat> with the, the tank owner and solve the leak. And we did all this work and it was super hard. But what we discovered because of the design of the box we could not replace the actual bulkhead. The bulkhead itself clearly had been installed inside the overflow box as they were gluing it together. It was a forever bulkhead and there's no way to remove it. It's physically impossible, not possible. So we replaced all the gaskets and we screwed it all back together again and we still end up having a minor, minor drip. So frustrating. So he's gonna have to actually replace the box with new bulkheads because those bulkheads are nine years old. And we, you know, he even bought them, but we couldn't put them in. <laughs> so that was very frustrating. But we worked on the tank, and while I was there, we went ahead and we cleaned all of the returns, you know, the, the lines coming back into the tank. They were covered in algae and vermitids. Uh, there was also another nozzle that came in that came from the chiller, which was covered in all kinds of stuff. And I cleaned six of the gyres, you know, the max spec gyres. Oh, those are such a pain to clean. I broke them all down. We cleaned the inner overflow boxes. We cleaned the outer overflow boxes, the dursos and the emergency drains. I scrubbed all that PVC. I mean, everything from the top was cleaned and everything underneath is gonna be a subsequent visit. We definitely got more flow in the tank when I left than when I arrived. When I arrived, I'm looking at the tank and I was like, there's no flow in here. And he says, oh yeah, it's all running. It's just really clear. And I was like, mm, I don't think so. And once I got all those gyres cleaned up and you know, operational, we saw stuff blowing everywhere. And I was like, okay, good. This is how a reef should look. Even, you know, in this video, if you look at the surface of my water, it's really rippling along nicely. You want the top of your tank to look like that. And if it doesn't look like that, why isn't it? Why does it look like a, the, the surface of a nice still pond? <laughs> That's not good. We want to have good oxygen exchange. And by having rippling water on the top, you're going to be off gassing CO2. You're going to be bringing in uh, some fresh air. It's good for the tank. And we want to make sure that there's no oil slicks on the surface. So that's why those overflow boxes need to be completely clean and not full of all kinds of weird life that's living in there and clogging up, you know, the veins of the system, so to speak, or the arteries, I guess I should say. But um, yeah, that was a big thing. It took six hours. It was a lot of work. And I would have loved to just completely replace the bulkhead. And then everything underneath was rigid PVC. And I shared a picture of that with some friends recently. 
And they said, Mark, that looks like something you plumbed. <laughs> I was like, I did. I actually put together all that plumbing years ago. And they said, yeah, it looks like yours. And I was thinking, really, does do I have a, a plumbing look? <laughs> I didn't realize I had a tell, but I do. <clears throat> Let's see. Wilmar, thank you very much for the super chat. He said, this live stream is what people need to hear. Now we can show it to them, to the people complaining about our hobby. <clears throat> <laughs> I knew this was going to be one of those answers. I don't know about you, Milo's Reef, but I pet my poison arrow tree frog. <laughs> I just knew it. I just knew there's someone out there that's just like, like an evil villain just petting their poisonous animal. By the way, do you guys like my shirt? Let me back up a little bit. Isn't that great? Actually, this is not what I asked for. I asked for a shirt with two life-size zoanthids. Little, tiny, little, itty-bitty ones, because I thought that'd be way funnier. Instead, I got these two giant zoanthids. This was a t-shirt given to me as a gift from Lazy Coffee Designs. I follow her on Instagram. She does beautiful artwork, and she sells stickers and, and all kinds of merch and pillows and things. And I've been buying from her for quite a while. Uh, last Christmas, I was wearing the shirt of the uh, the blotched Antheus with a with a Santa cap, and uh, I wore that like every week for four weeks because it was Christmas time. Well, she sent me this, but I I still want her to make me a new shirt with two tiny zoanthids, really really tiny, to where someone's like, "What are those? Like they're zoanthids? Can't you tell they're this big? You know, like like real life." I think that would be way funnier than this shirt right now. But I'm sure there's gonna be many women that want to wear a shirt that looks like this. Because I saw people posting, I want one. So I know it's true. Ryan says, I have several friends getting into the hobby. What I find very easy for myself to do is uh, to get too much into the weeds. I need to keep the most rele relevant information. Yeah, we need to keep it basic. What is the core knowledge you need to have? And then we can start expanding into further. And I mean, that's just like everything you learn. When you go to school, the first thing you learn to do is what are colors? <laughs> and then you start to learn the alphabet. And then you start to learn words, you know I mean? It's just, and then you start to learn how to write and you learn how to do book reports. And then you learn a new language. You don't start with a new language in the beginning other than the language of your household. But I mean, it, it's just the thing. You know, I remember in school, I took math, 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 math. And then one day it was algebra, and then it was geometry, and then it was trigonometry, and then it was something worse. And I remember I didn't do well at that one because it was even worse. But you, you can't just go straight into trigonometry. You have to start off with the basics. Uh, Kyle says, I'm a first-time reefer that jumped in head first, approaching a one-year. Uh, my biggest challenge I still have is understanding flow. I tried for random, but I feel like I'm missing some understanding. And then he also said, do you do consulting? And is this something that you could assist with? Yes, I actually do offer a video consultation. It's an hour and we can use Messenger video, FaceTime, Skype, whatever you like. I charge $125 for that call. And it's not like a subscription. <laughs> you know, it's a one-time call, but that's what I charge for my consultations. And I will literally tailor exactly what your questions are and put you, I'll point you to all the links so you get extra information. And I'm sure that by the end of the phone call, you'll have some good solid goals and good solid uh, a path uh, to accomplish what you're trying to resolve or what you're trying to do next. Um, that's why I'm here. This is literally what I do. That's right. The Reef Chemistry Calculator is what uh, Reef Keeper put up here, Reef Diests. <laughs> I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Uh, but that's been a super handy calculator. I've been using it for years. And I have it bookmarked, but I usually just type Reef Chemistry Calculator in Google. It just gets me there faster. Jerome, or Jerome Me, maybe, says, have any of you reefers noticed that your HVAC system and your salty rooms are rusting? I bought a house that had 125 gallon ish as a reef, and that room has uh, the air conditioner heater work, and the floor is corroding like crazy. Yes, uh, vents on the floor are going to be the first to rust, but even the vents on the ceiling will rust, and I just replaced them 
frequently. Every couple of years, I replace them. You can also run a dehumidifier in your home to absorb some of that moisture and salty air, and that will help to protect your, your metal parts in the house. But it's, it is damaged, and it can happen, and it can spread. It, it can be in many places. So it wouldn't be a surprise that it's happening. It all comes down to humidity and salt corrosion, and that happens everywhere. You may be able to find plastic vents instead that you can just wipe clean, and that way you don't have to deal with a rust issue. Uh, Mike says, thanks for the input on the acrylic material pricing the other day. What about a place, uh, was about to place an order, but you're out of ICP tests. Actually, I have new ICP tests. They're not with uh, icpanalysis.com. They are with Reef Labs uh, out of Florida. And I have all those kits in stock, and I was supposed to get them on the website last week. I even took pictures. I will spend some time today to get them on the website. I love the uh, reports I get from them. Uh, and uh, actually, I'm a little annoyed at what happened this week. I shipped off a sample on Tuesday, and I paid for second-day delivery, which costs a little bit more than ground. And I thought, you know, I haven't got my report yet. Let me just jump on the website, and it didn't show up. I thought, well, that's weird because I sent it on Tuesday and I should have got a, a report either Thursday or Friday. And I looked and they haven't received it. And then I went and looked up UPS and apparently my sample sat at the UPS store for two days before they shipped it. So they probably get it today, which means I'll get my report on Monday. But it's like, dang it, I paid extra money to get it there quicker and it sat there. So I'm going to go to the UPS store and see if um, they're going to refund me some of that shipping. But I do, I pay for UPS instead of just mail because it gets there a little quicker and I get my results a little quicker. I'm just a little bit impatient on getting my results because I'm doing some specific dosing. Rather be traveling says, the problem is where I live, the local fish store is Petco. All the other local fish stores have gone out of business. Yeah, that's a problem. I'm lucky that there's still fish stores, but I mean, one day Frank's Tanks is going to go away. And Frank's Tanks is literally down the street from me where I can just walk there and come back with a bag of whatever. <laughs> but I usually drive. But it's close enough to walk. It takes me about 10 minutes. So um, the economy has been really hard on many companies, and it's been hard on online businesses too. I mean, it's, it's just hard. Right now, a lot of people are scared to spend money at all. So at your Petco, they probably have someone in charge of the saltwater section and if you can get to know that person and have more communication with them, who knows? Maybe through osmosis you can help each other become better. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to, because not every Petco is evil. And I think that's kind of, people will just put that out there into the web. Like, oh, they just treat everything wrong or they do this or that. But then they're so happy to say, look, I got this thing. They didn't know what it was, so I got it for dirt cheap because they had it mismarked. So which is it? They're evil or they make mistakes. <laughs> it's like, okay, we need to find a happy medium and we need to work together because we all need to, again, put food in our bellies. And so everyone's money matters and the money has to keep making a circle. And we do need businesses to stay around so that we can continue to shop from them. Uh, Rick says, my tank is five years old. What issues might I expect now that makes saltwater so hard? I would say at this point, old tank syndrome, which is really old reefer syndrome because we become lazy uh, after a, a fixed amount of years because you're so used to your tank that you start neglecting it. It may be time for a reef reset to where you start culling it like I do with Duane, or it could be time to really give the sand bed a good vacuuming. Uh, it could be that some gear is now needing to be replaced, including lights, because you know the lights that we buy, the LED lights, they have a five-year lifespan. And people, you know, they bought them. They're like, oh, it's going to last me five years. I'm not, to, I won't have to buy more bulbs now. I'm going to save all this money. Well, then five years elapses and they say, my tank isn't doing so well. It's because the lights have become less effective. They used to be great, but they've gotten worn out with, you know, the time. They're running eight hours a day, 12 hours a day, and they're running seven days a week and they are gradually deteriorating or the cooling fan no longer spins on it, or it's clogged up with stuff, or the lights have just burned out some diodes, or you know the lights themselves are just 10 or 15% dimmer than they were originally. 
And so it's just time to replace the lights. And I had a friend who said, man, my reef, I'm just, oh, my reef, my reef, my reef. He was not happy. And I said, how old are those lights? He goes, oh, I don't know, six, seven years. I said, you're well beyond the lifespan of those lights. It's time for new ones. And he said, are you sure? And I'm like, he goes, because they're working. <laughs> I said, I'm positive. You could say the same thing about metal halide bulbs or T5 bulbs or, or VHOs. They're still working. They didn't burn out. Well, we knew you had to replace your bulbs at 12 months. We knew that your T5s were good for nine months. We knew that VHOs were good for like 12 to 18 months. I mean, there was just these rules and you follow the schedule, just like changing the filter on your air conditioner. You know, um, some homes you have to change it every month. Other homes you can change it every quarter or every six months. Depends on the filter, but the unit has a certain rule. So anyway, he got new lights and his whole tank just came to life and it's growing full and he's telling me now I'm bored. <laughs> and I was like, I know, because you haven't had your hands in the tank in forever. It's literally doing well and you're not having to fight it and you're not having to deal with issues and it's filled with beautiful corals. He's like, yeah, but I'm bored. I guess maybe the challenge of fixing the problems was what kept me interested. I was like, how about you just enjoy that it's not being a pain because so often we struggle so hard to get it back on track. Well, once you got on track and it's doing good, you should be sitting back and enjoying it like I do with mine. I just keep looking at it going, man, this is doing well. And I mean, you haven't heard me complain about major issues in my tank in a long time. I might mention one piece of gear has an issue and I solve it or resolve it, but the tank is doing well. And I am very aware that it's doing well. I'm not going to miss the good being by focusing on the bad. So if that helps you, Rick, <laughs> I'm glad. Let's see. Josh says, I'm moving a tank from North Carolina to Texas. Do you think I should replace the sand bed or just leave enough water in the tank so it stays submerged till I get there? The tank is only six months old. Since it's only six months old, you could literally move the sand without any issue. You don't have to leave it in the tank. You could scoop it out and put it into a bucket and uh, have a little bit of water in there to have you know an, an inch of water on top and make your trip. If the tank was more than six months old, I would say wash the sand out completely and start fresh. Just clean, rinsed sand. I don't like leaving sand in an aquarium because aquariums have to be lifted and they get racked a little bit as you're carrying them with a helper and the extra weight on that bottom pane could just shatter it. And now you've got sand and glass everywhere and you've got livestock in a barrel and you don't have a tank for your destination. So it's much smarter to move an aquarium empty if you can. If you absolutely do not want to or you're, you're fighting me on this, if you can put a board under the tank and you're holding the board, that will support the tank better because it's on a board. But the tank could slide off the board. So now it's like, do I want to put on a board and strap it on with like the orange ratchet straps to lock it on there? You could, but it might just be simpler. Just take the sand out, put it in a bucket, and then clean the tank really, really well because now it's empty. And you can clean up all the algae and get it completely pristine. Set up the new tank, put your sand back in there, put your rock in there, add salt water, and get, get it cycling again. Um, Josh says, I'm not sure how old the sand is. All right, well, but when it came with a tank, but I bought it, I just rinsed the heck out of it in a bucket and it wasn't putting out any dirty water. So yeah, the sand does sound like it's still clean. Uh, Dave, Dave, David, <laughs> I'm not sure how we're saying this, but hi from the UK. I started off with a secondhand tank, rock and fish three and a half years ago. Moved on to a new custom tank and Ecotech gear. Yes, new setup is expensive, but buy good gear and you only buy it once. That's how I feel. I put two MP60s on my reef 10 years ago. And last year I bought new ones, even though mine were completely functional. I was like, I just want to replace them before they break. They've run nonstop for 10 years. They've run during power outages on my battery backup system. They did their job, and I just felt like it was time. And I bought two new ones and put them on the tank. And I was like, why would you do that? I said, because they were 10 years old. It's sort of like I had a Ford Explorer for 14 years. 14? That sounds right. 
and I bought myself a brand new truck. But the Ford Explorer wasn't broken. The reason I bought the brand new truck while the Ford Explorer wasn't broken is so I wouldn't be painted into a corner and had to buy a vehicle in a panic. Instead, I could literally walk away from the deal. And I'm not doing that as a haggling thing. I literally had the option to say, eh, okay, it didn't work out. I'll buy something else somewhere else. But I had a fully functional vehicle with a transmission that hadn't broken, with an engine that was fine, with all the little accessories still working. Nothing was dead on my car. And I'd had that car for a super long time. And it was nice for eight years to not have a car payment. And now I've been in this truck for a few years. And I think I have two more years of payments. And I can't wait for them to stop. But, you know, I did replace something that wasn't broken. I got a new one because it was just time. And sometimes we have to do that with our equipment. <laughs> Brennan's Reef uh, just gave me a super chat. Thank you so much. And he says, to help with the inflation. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Uh, Sharon says, I've always been prepared with redundancy, even though it could be expensive, and it took me a while. I've been in the hobby for six years now. You know, one of the great ways to get some redundancy is to buy used setups. And I know some people would do that. They would buy one used setup after another, and they really were just doing it to flip them. They were trying to just get it for a deal and then resell it to recoup money. But at the same time, certain pieces of gear became extra. They might have a backup chiller. They might have a, a, a backup quarantine tank. Or they got an extra RO system with a bunch of filters, and they got more filters. And then they sold the RO system to someone else. So the, again, the whole buying used stuff, there's a whole market for that. <laughs> and it can be a way to save some money, and it can be a way to make some money. For me, I'm a hoarder. I buy everything, and I keep it forever, and I don't share my toys. Okay, true story. I haven't shared this in a long time, so I'm going to share it with you guys because you're probably a new audience. Years and years ago, I had a couple of guys over here that were friends of mine, and we went to dinner, and at the dinner table, um, my friend Drew said, I need to get a new dart pump for my reef, and I just need to order it. And I just nodded and said, okay. <laughs> That's all I needed to hear. He's going to order it. He needs to do this. He'll do it. And then he later on found out that I had a brand new dart pump sitting here. And he says, Mark, why wouldn't you just give me that dart pump? I was like, that's my backup. If mine fails, that's my backup. And he said, I would have replaced it. I could have literally bought a new one and had shipped to your door. I said, yeah, but there'll be four or five days where I wouldn't have a backup. And that's when things break. And he said, you are such an only child. And I just started laughing because he's, he's right. I am an only child. And I bought a backup to protect my reef. It's just like the one time, and it, that's just, it's hilarious. He says, I can't believe you didn't just give me a pump so I could get things going. I'm like, you told me you're ordering one. <laughs> Why should I have to give away what I put here on purpose to protect my reef? Another time I lent out my generator to someone that didn't live too far away. He's about 10 minutes away, says, Mark, my power's gonna be out on my street. Can I borrow your generator? I just need it for the day. I said, yes, but if for some reason my power goes out, I'm going to need it back. And he goes, no, I understand, no problem. Well, I, when he showed up, I was pouring gas from a gas can into the generator. And he says, what are you doing? I says, I'm filling it up. He says, you didn't have to do that. And I was like, well, you asked for a generator. I figure you need one that runs. So I filled up with gas. I mean, it just seems logical. Even when you rent a car, it comes with a tank full of gas. You don't have to go get gas. So anyway, he got the generator. He drove away. A week later, I'm like, hello, where's my generator? And he's like, oh, yeah, I need to get that back to you. Do you think you'd be available this weekend? I'm like, I'm available now. Why do I not have it back? I gave it to you for that day. What are you doing? And he just says, I'm sorry. And it was just kind of a little bit annoying because that is literally my backup if the power goes out to keep my reef alive. Now, could I drive over to his house 10 minutes and go get it? Yes, but should I have to when he's the borrower? Kind of bugged me. But, you know, it doesn't prevent me from occasionally rent, uh, lending something out. But at the same time, we always want to make sure we have a backup for our reef. And so I'm not really keen on giving away things like return pumps and, chi and, and uh, generators because those are the lifeblood of the aquarium if the power goes out. Oh, I like that. Santana Reef says, I have an idea for your green screen. How do you know there's a green screen around me? He says, do a Facebook contest um, 
one a week of people's videos that they take, and then you and the mods can choose which video to put on there for the next one. Actually, what we could do, even better, we could feature the tank for a couple of minutes and talk about its setup, and you could just see the video of the tank. Or you could see the whole video. I could literally get myself off the screen, and you would just have their aquarium and see their filtration, all that kind of stuff. It could be like a little video tour. That could be fun, too. It doesn't even have to be a contest, necessarily, other than it's got to be a good enough video I'm willing to share it. <laughs> But yeah, that could be nice. I like that. That's a nice idea. Uh, he's saying, you know, you could put it on a loop. You could have it running in the background. It's true. That's a nice idea. Thank you very much for the suggestion. Uh, David says, at my local fish store today, the tiny red leg crabs were $7 each, seven pounds each, where two years ago they were only two pounds. Yep. Um, Josh asked this to the entire chat, and so if you're watching this show or listening to it later and you want to reply in the comments beneath the video, he wants to know, is $600 too much for an 8-inch blue spot squamosa clam? Uh, I have a friend who has it and I really want to buy it, but I don't want to overpay in case I have to sell it when I have to move in a month. If you're going to move, don't buy a clam. But uh, $600 seems like a lot for a clam. Fernando said, the clam is worth whatever you're willing to pay for it. But if you're about to move, I wouldn't buy a clam, because the clam is not going to like the move. TK is checking in. Hey, TK. Says, it's been a while, but nice to tune back in. Yep, I'm always here. I never go away. We should really look up and see how many live streams we've done on this channel, because I'm sure it's getting up there. Let's see. <laughs> Jim says, your tank is growing so well, it's almost time to get Dwayne back out here for another reset. I actually told Dwayne that I'd like to have him come out here again, but not do anything. Because every time I bring him here, I make him do stuff. Work on the tank. Fix my sheetrock. <laughs> I said, my house is almost done. Um, and I want you to just come here and just enjoy a nice house. And we'll hang out by the fire pit and we'll just trade stories. And he loved that idea. And I think that's the right thing. I mean, it's time to just hang out and not make it so businessy. <laughs> uh, in case you've been wondering where Jack is, Jack is not here. I actually took her to be boarded right before the live stream because tomorrow my son and his wife are going to be here and we're going to pack everything I own that's in anything, on any shelf, in any dresser, in any bookcase, going into boxes because Monday everything has to be removed so that the carpet can be replaced. So we're packing up all my contents, all the stuff behind this green screen. <laughs> uh, everything in the bookcases, everything everywhere has got to be packed up. And then I was told they're going to do one room at a time, which is great. And they literally will move the furniture. They will take a bed apart and remove it, do the carpet in the room, put the bed back. Amazing. And uh, But the dressers and the bookcases have to be empty for them to lift it. So we're going to spend all day tomorrow doing that. I didn't want Jack to be here. And uh, I don't want my grandson to be here because we're literally going to be working and filling boxes. We're going to use every Mila's Reef box I own <laughs> to put everything in. And my thought process is get everything outside onto a big tarp. And hopefully the weather will cooperate. And if it doesn't, I'll put a tarp over everything and or two tarps to keep the water away. Um, and then decide what's coming back in the house. And everything else will stay out of the house. And it will end up to the curb or to... Uh, be donated or to be thrown away. So I, I want to declutter some and just kind of have beautiful, nice, fantastic carpet. You guys don't understand. I am a huge carpet fan. I talked about this last week. I don't want to get into it all over again, but it's happening on Monday and I'm super excited. And so when Dwayne comes, walls will have been painted, ceilings will have been painted, carpets are replaced. I mean, it's going to be like a whole new place for him. And it's going to hide all of his sheetrock work. And it's going to look amazing. Let's see. Drug Monkey RX, you must be a pharmacist, says Reef is looking sharp. Good work, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It is doing really, really well. It's very pretty. I love it. Yeah, Sharon, my potassium was one of the things that I had a big deficit in. And it was just low in some other weird trace elements. Low in cobalt, low in uh, selenium, vanadium, 
manganese. You know, these are all things I've been dumping in. And also, I've been adding calcium carbonate to the tank to supplement the calcium reactor to push that calcium number up a little bit higher because my tank notoriously seems to be about 350 and it should be between 375 and 450, which is exactly why I wanted to check that ICP test and see what they said it was. And it wasn't there yet. They didn't get it. So annoying. Michael says, will Kalkwasser raise your alkalinity? Um, it can, but it's not usually used as a raiser as much as a maintainer. So a lot of times with tanks, the person using Kalkwasser is maintaining cal uh, alkaline and calcium in a balanced way. Instead of dosing two-part, they would literally just use Kalkwasser. And m more often than not, Kalkwasser dosing was done as top-off. So instead of using top-off water of RODI, they were topping off RODI mixed with Kalkwasser powder, and that would then be added to the tank gradually throughout the day or overnight, and it would help maintain it. So if you had a tank that was really low on alkaline and low on calcium, adding Kalkwasser wouldn't raise it. You had to do some big water changes, get the number back where it belonged, and then Kalkwasser would keep it there. If you're trying to raise alkalinity, I would use baked baking soda, which is called soda ash. And it's super easy to make your own. I have an article on my website. Just type into Google DIY soda ash, Mila's Reef, and you'll get my article. And it shows you how to make your own powder for a dollar. One dollar! And I do that two, three times a year. I make a dollar's worth of, of alkalinity powder. And uh, last week when my calcium reactor was acting up and I explained what happened two weeks ago, um, I just put in two tablespoons of my baked baking soda, mixed in some water and poured in the tank and kept my alkaline at the right level while the calcium reactor took a day to get resolved. And then the next day it wasn't quite there and I did it again. I put in two more tablespoons and two tablespoons in my reef is my math. It's so easy. But if you want to make alkalinity dosing solution, you bake the baking soda and you use two cups of that soda ash with one gallon of RODI water and that is your alkalinity uh, dosing fluid. Super cheap to make. One dollar and three cents of RODI water. Adrian says, do you recommend monthly uh, routine ICP tests? <sighs> It's, that's a preference. Uh, for me, I'm doing them weekly because I'm in the middle of something, but it seems... Okay, here's what I would suggest. If your tank is doing great, do an ICP test right now and find out what those levels are so you have a baseline. And that way, if the tank starts to be bad at some point, you can send off another sample and you can compare to your first one when things are going well and you can see what's changed and you can say, oh, when my <laughs> rubidium was just right, I... You know, but now there's none present, or I have way too much of it. And so you at least know what the flaw is in the water. And so that. But, you know, I mean, some people just do it once every six months or once a year. They just kind of are curious how it's doing. For me, I, I'm wanting to know exactly something. And I want to know that what I'm dosing, I'm not overdosing. I don't want to go too far. Right now, I'm actually low on potassium. And I bought a bottle, and I did all the math, and it, according to the math, I need to use three quarters of that bottle to get my potassium back to 400 ppm. And it looks like in my future, I'm going to be dosing potassium on a constant basis, not occasionally. I mean, I don't think it'll be a lot, but I want to maintain 400. I don't like that it dips down to 360. Where is it going? <laughs> I know the corals are using it, and I know when you do a water change, you lose some, but I lost 40 ppm. So that's why I had to get a whole bottle of it. And uh, what I need to do, and like my friend Scott the other day said, I need to open an account with a chemical supplier and get myself a nice big 50-pound bag of potassium chloride and start making my own and saving some money because I need so much of it. I mean, I don't know. Everything costs money to run these tanks. <laughs> Estonian Reefer, your question makes me laugh. Have you got any torch corals? And if not, do you even like torch corals? I do not have any torch corals, and no, I don't like them. It, it just makes me giggle inside. Um, torch corals sting their neighbors. And so I have a tank full of stuff. You can see it. Where am I going to put the torch? If I put it down low, it's going to sting the chalice. It's going to sting the, uh, the uh, tongue coral. It could sting that acro. It could sting that lithophylon. It could sting the fungia. It could sting that favia. It could sting the other chalice. I mean, all those things at the bottom wouldn't work. 
If I put up higher, it's going to sting all the SPS. If I put near the hammer, it's going to sting the hammer. So there's just no benefit. I, I don't have a passion for torches. People love them. They like spending lots of money. For some reason, it just seems to me, my interpretation, that torches can suffer from brown jelly disease more than frog spawn and hammer and frammer. I mean, I've been keeping hammer and frammer for the last year without a hiccup. I have two polyps of frog spawn that are just little tiny guys and they're barely surviving, but they're in a lot of shade from the hammer coral, so that could be part of it. But I, I kind of miss frog spawn. I think it's really pretty, and I would have to like remove an entire Duncan to put in a nice size frog spawn to get that look again. But I, I like its look. But I would not get a torch. It's just, it's just not for me. And I kind of feel like these days, everyone has a torch or a whole bunch of torches. And when you look at their tank, you see lots of torches. It looks like fireworks everywhere, whether the flow is on or off. But there's nothing else. It's just like all these torches everywhere. And I'm like, oh, that's why they don't have any you know, real serious SPS collections. They can't put them anywhere near these torches because they're big, long sweepers. Uh, Huang says, how or what can I use to clean acrylic without scratching it? Also, the brain coral is still alive, but is uh, probably receding very, very slowly. It's been a month now since I asked you about the one in my system. Uh, I don't remember your brain coral. I need you to send me another picture so I can look at it. To clean the acrylic on the outside, you can use vinegar and water. You can use uh, the Fritz Aquarium Cleaner Spray that's safe for glass and acrylic. Uh, don't use Windex. Uh, just water can work. On the inside, it's a little harder to do. I mean, basically, we just want to clean it as best we can with a credit card, and that way we don't scratch it with metal, because metal will leave scratches in your uh, acrylic panes. And if you do have little tiny minor scratches on the inside, that's usually the first spot algae will grow, and you'll have like this green line in your field of view. So you got to scrape it out with a credit card again. And then you can use a cleaning magnet with a special pad designed to slide on acrylic that is not like the regular Velcro type stuff. It's kind of a scrubby pad that's a softer material, softer than the acrylic itself, and that prevents it. But if you do a water change and your acrylic looks kind of foggy, that's kind of normal. Usually the water kind of hides most of it, but if you want to really make your tank like new again, you take everything out and you polish the inside and it takes you all week to just make it look brand new again, and it's a whole skill. I'm friends with a guy who does custom tanks, uh, custom polishing of tanks, and he travels all over the U.S., and he just showed a video last week of this tank that looked horrific, and he said that what caused all the, the weird, like, circle scratches, he felt like a fish or a fish were doing it. They were, like, using that spine on their cheek and just constantly hitting it, and it looked horrible, and he had a light at the angle to really highlight how bad it was, and then he showed it when he was all done, and you could look through, and it looked like a tank with no water, and everything in the background was perfect. And the only spot where you saw those weird swirls was on the overflow box where it was black acrylic, because he didn't polish that part. Was it necessary? Wasn't I mean, he could have, but he didn't. And he was showing it as you know to show the difference between the two panes, even though just the first video versus the second, it literally looked like there was no tank there at all. He did a fantastic job, but this is what he does for a living, and he does fantastic work. Uh, I'd say the name of his company if I could think of it right now. But uh, his name is Matt. C Clear? C Clear? Might be the name of the company. Anyway, that might be it. Try looking up C Clear uh, acrylic polishing and see if that gets you his company. Let's see. Holla at your boy. <laughs> Holla at your reef boy says, I always enjoy seeing your beautiful corals or beautiful reef. Curious, what's your single top favorite? It can be fish, coral, or invertebrate. Um, I have a few choice pieces. I really love my dendros, and uh, I'm enjoying that one acro that's right over the yellow tang this second. That one right there, I don't even know what it is. I can't seem to get a solid name of what it is. I really like it a lot. Of course, the green slimer at the top, I'm loving how good that looks because for the longest time, I couldn't even keep a green slimer alive, and boom, I turned a frag into a colony after, you know, 26 years of practice. <laughs> Jason says, do you have any Nero 3s available? Yes, I do. I believe I have one or two in stock. And I can ship it out on Monday. Uh, 
Oh, nice. Uh, Mina said, I, my brother just came over and has helped me out with the controller board. So I'll have a TikTok up by tonight. Thanks again, sir. I am very happy to see this video because I want to see what you did with it. I'm very excited. Uh, there was actually, I need to start getting these moderators cases too, because every moderator got a controller board and I want to see how they look. And then Atkins Nature Aquarium says, I picked up two new hammers today, an or orange Leptastria, a Raja Rampage Chalice, an Akan Ekanata. I'm getting ready to dip them all now. Good. Always dip those new corals so we don't introduce problems or pests into the aquarium as hitchhikers. Um... Lincoln Town says, I recently light shocked some of my corals. How long do you think it takes for corals to bounce back from that? Oh, well, you know, when things like that happen, I usually say it's going to be 6 to 12 weeks. You know, I, I tend to think of it as, okay, we're going to have to wait three months for that to look normal again. It takes a while for things to recover. It, it takes forever to grow something, and then it goes wrong so quickly, and it takes so long to recover from it that you're just like, you're you're mad at the time you lost. You're mad at, that you gotta wait three more months to get back where you were. It's just like you went back in the race, you're further away from the finish line than you were originally. It's so annoying. And then Michael says, what can I use to raise calcium and not raise alkalinity? My alkalinity is 11.94, but my calcium is 416. Actually, both numbers are perfect. I wouldn't change either one, or I'd let the alkaline. Actually, the alkaline can come down a little bit. The goal is between 8 and 11, and you're at 11.94, so you're at 12. And you don't need to be at 12. Your calcium level is 416. Well, the goal is 375 to 450. You're right there in the middle. I mean, 425 would be the, the exact middle. If you want to use calcium chloride, you can. And there's a lot of products. I sell one on my website from Frank's Brew. That's the calcium additive. You just mix it up with a gallon of RO water, and you can dose that into your tank to bring calcium up. Um, and you don't have to put anything in to raise alkalinity right now. The alkalinity should just, it should be dissipating. And if your tank is anything like my tank, it will come down a little bit each day. So if you check the alkalinity again in like three days after not dosing anything at all, it probably will measure 11. In my tank, it would be down, you know, if I keep it at nine and I don't have any alkalinity for two days, my tank's at seven. It comes down that hard because all these corals right here are growing like crazy. Uh, Rather Be Traveling says, what gravel vac is best for sucking up the crap? I have a Python gravel cleaner and a hose that's about 50 feet, but it doesn't seem to be moving the crap out of the tank. Uh, it could be your gravel vac isn't the right size. You know, like maybe you have a cute one instead of the big long tube, but normally... When you push down, you should see all kinds of brown like smoke coming up. I have not used the Python with the sink system. I use a gravel vac that is connected to a hose that goes into a bucket by my feet. And I just start the siphon and put the hose in the bucket. And then I work the, the sand bed and I, I pinch the hose when I'm you know stopping at one point or I'm trying to make the sand um, drizzle back out of the tube to make sure I don't suck sand out accidentally. I don't think there's a certain vac that's better than another. I don't think there's a bad one out there, to be honest. I think they all kind of do the same thing. So try that. <laughs> Winter water loves my Zoa boobs. Thank you. I just want them to be Zoa nipples. That's what I want. Um, Jaws Reef says, is that some uptage on the right side near the NEM or something else? It is something else. It is a mini, or what I call the nano bubble tip anemones. They get to be about two and a half inches in diameter, and a couple snuck in my tank, and there's about 10 that I need to peel out of the reef, and I haven't done it yet. Oh, that's neat. Reefing with O says there's a program called VitaCare. It costs you $10 a month, and you get 20% off everything aquatic, and you get a $5 gift card every month. So you pay 10 bucks a month and you get $5 back of that. All right. And he says, I get my instant ocean salt for $27. Okay. Thanks for the tip.
Huang says, with all your advice for all these years, my nano tank as of today is two years old. Happy reef anniversary! All the corals are growing. Thank you, Mr. Mark. You're welcome. Lincoln wants to know, is mixing LED light brands a problem? I want to replace my primes with radions as they break. No, it's not a problem, and you can do it systematically. It just The tank will look different because you have two different lights next to each other. So perhaps put the radion... I don't know. I don't know how many lights you have. Let's pretend you have three. So you replace the middle one with a radion, and then you can replace the left one and then the right one. You know, Or you can buy them all from, I don't know, me, <laughs> and use Affirm and get all the lights at once and make monthly payments. I mean, that's just something to consider. Uh, it's a possibility. But, I mean, you can just take your time and do them one at a time. It won't hurt your tank. The big trick is getting the light to equalize so you don't light shock your reef. I mean, I think it was you before saying how you did shock some corals, and that could be the light was too intense compared to the other light that wasn't intense enough, and the lights ran too long. So I got the impression you already resolved that because you said how long till the corals look better again. So I'm assuming you already made your correction. If you didn't, lessen the intensity of the new light and lessen the duration of the light for the day so it doesn't have the opportunity to bleach out these corals like it was initially from, you know, overpowering the reef accidentally. Um, Bob says, I'm thinking about starting either a micro lord or a favia garden. We'll probably eventually do both, but I'm still rel relatively new. Would one or the other be a bit more forgiving for newbies? The uh, micro lords or the, the lord hoensis, you know, so we're talking about acans. That's what I call them. Other people call them micromusa now because they want to change names on me, but I'm, I'm still an acan guy. Uh, I like acans. As long as you don't get echinata, get all the lord hoensis you can get. Don't get Echinata. Echinata eats their neighbor. Lord Hoensis doesn't. The difference between a Lord and an, an Echinata, the Lord is individual polyps all mashed together in, in their little colony. Echinata kind of looks like continuous skin, and you can see mouths, but they don't have dividers. They're not individual. It's just kind of like this thing with multiple uh, mouths. Um, and others have in the past, this, this was a terrible habit that people used, and I don't hear it as much, but they used to call them the eyes, <laughs> and they weren't. There's no eyes. They're mouths. They open the mouth to eat. They poop out, you know, excess zoanthelli. So, echinata, don't get that. Make sure you don't get echinata. Just get Lord Hoensis. And you can get all the acans you want, all the different colors, and they all can rub against each other, and you can make a beautiful garden. The Fabias, they're slower growing. Um, they have less movement. They're really stationary. They don't all grow together nicely. You could have a nice collection of them, but they're all going to need space. And then if any get near each other as the tissue comes together, you might have like a burn line between the two, and it's just white, and they're tolerating each other. And then maybe one will grow upward. Maybe both will grow upward and kind of create this little weird wall. Or one will just come over the top and start going after the other guy. So I would go with the Lord's. Uh, Pelle says, hello from Denmark. What did you do to get your copper band butterfly to fish to eat? And what do you feed it? And do you have any good advice? I only give out the bad advice on this channel. No, um, I made sure that the copper band was eating at the fish store when I bought it. And, I, and so they showed it to me. And I said, I'll take that fish and I'll take that food. And I came home with their food and, their co and that copper band. And then in my tank, after I went through safety stop, I put in the peacemaker which is an acrylic box that has holes drilled in the side and it sits in the aquarium. And for the three days it's waiting to be introduced to the reef, I keep putting that food in I got from the fish store that it was eating. And then after I released it in the reef, I would take some of that fish food from the fish store and use some of my own fish food and I'd put both in there because I knew the copper band would recognize the food it was eating before and it, it wouldn't care about the other food, right? And then eventually, you keep watching and you'll say, hey, that copper band is eating my fish food. Fantastic. And you don't have to keep using that food you got from the fish store. You can just literally, it's weaned off of one and it's on. So I, every single day I put mini mysis in my tank and that has been the food it likes. Copper bands are notoriously difficult to get to eat in the first place. And if you can't get one that's eating from the fish store, you might not want to buy it. But if you have access to black worms, which is a very specific thing, if you can get live black worms, the copper bands really like those. 
and you can keep putting that in. And the nice thing about black worms is you can keep them in the refrigerator and they keep making more of themselves and you take out some and I think you rinse it and you put those in the tank and your copper van eats and then you go to the fridge and there's, and you have to kind of change the water in that bowl once a week or something. Unfortunately, where I live, I can't get black worms. And what's crazy is they exist in California, and apparently they exist on the East Coast as well. But I guess they aren't allowed to ship them to Texas? <laughs> I don't understand it. Weird, right? So I was using frozen blood worms as a choice for the copper band, and they did eat some of them. But after a while, I noticed he didn't care. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to buy those anymore. So I just use mini mices. So I use PE mysis, which is big, and I use mini mysis because I want to make sure that it will fit the snout of that copper band butterfly. Uh, Winter Water says, I have a short green hair algae that is too hard. I can literally move the rock structure when I'm trying to rip it off. What the heck is it? I keep my phosphate at 0 0.03 and I'm using lanthanum. Uh, fine. So what you have is bryopsis. Bryopsis is very coarse to the touch and it holds onto the rock really well. There's a couple of techniques. Uh, one is to take putty, like the two-part putty you're going to use to uh, uh, secure a coral to the rock, and you basically blanket the bryopsis with this putty for a few weeks, and then you can just peel it off and the bryopsis died. It's gone. Another method might be to use epiptasia and just cover it completely wait an hour for it to harden and then when you turn the flow on if it doesn't move leave the flow on if it starts to blow around turn off the flow again and wait another 15 minutes and then turn the flow back on and if it's hard everything underneath will die because fftasia has an acid in it and it kills whatever's under the blanket and um lettuce nudibranchs will eat bryopsis but you need to like take that feathery super light fluff of nothing and put it on the bryopsis and then the next day you got to go look for it and it's probably stuck to a power head and you have to remove it from the power head and put it back on the bryopsis. And it'll eat it, but you have to keep doing it. If uh, you can remove the rock, you could actually take it over the tank, uh, over the sink. And I would hold the rock in a certain direction to where I could drizzle hydrogen peroxide on it for about two or three minutes. I would just keep dripping it on there. Drip, drip, drip. Just, to, just imagine peroxide like acid. Just tss, tss, tss. And just keep hitting that algae over and over and over for a few minutes. And then I would flush the rock with a bunch of salt water from the tank. Just pour it over to kind of boil off the peroxide. And then put the rock back in your tank. Odds are there will still be peroxide in it. And you might watch all your snails run up the glass as fast as they can. Because the peroxide's in the water and they don't like that. That's why it's so important to rinse that rock really good before you put it back in the tank. Um, Sabazian says, I think corals right now are out of the reach of new reefers. I went to buy three corals, and I mean frags, and I spent $300. So in order for you to fill your tank with corals, it takes lots of money. Yeah, I could see that. And um, I'll tell you this. A lot of new hobbyists, they get the bug, and they really want corals, and they go shopping, and they find these deals, and they plant 30, 40, 50, 60 frags in their tank, and they're, like, everywhere, like, like little little gems right when i see that i just i feel kind of sad because i know it's number one it doesn't look good okay it's exciting for you it doesn't look good for the reef it doesn't look normal it looks weird and then the other thing is as they grow they're all going to hit each other and they're going to start killing each other and eventually you're going to be down to five species anyway so <laughs> there's no upside to putting in a ton of corals in your tank you know you put a few in some key spots and you take really good care of your tank, you let them grow into nice little colonies, and in six to nine months, you'll start to have something really nice to look at. It's just a waiting game. And then he added, I love your reef, you're my go-to reefer. Oh, well, thank you very much, I appreciate that. <laughs> Andrea, is com and she commented on my thing from 15 minutes ago. We only children do not share. Sorry, not sorry. So true, let me make that way bigger. <laughs> Sorry, not sorry. Let's see. Alex says, can two display tanks, let me shrink this back down, uh, share the same sump, or is it better to have separate sumps? Comes down to the livestock. Uh, I run the anemone cube and the 400-gallon reef off of one sump. 
You also want to make sure that in a power outage or if the return pump fails, that the water from both tanks draining will not overflow the sump. If you can set up a system like that where it's all operational and can handle holding all the water in a power outage, you can do it. But uh, for example, let's say you had a tank that you had to feed the heck out of to keep that livestock alive. Let's just say it's non-photosynthetic corals. And so you got to really, really feed it because that's the only way these animals survive. And then you've got it hooked up to an SPS reef that needs really pristine water and you're sharing one sump, that's not going to go well because all those nutrients from that one tank are going to pollute the other tank and the other tank's going to have algae problems galore. So in that situation, having the SPS reef with pristine water would get its own sump and then the non-photosynthetic would get its own simple sump that probably doesn't even have a skimmer, probably just uses a filter sock to catch particulates and you know it gets water changes occasionally. That's a real, that's a completely different aquarium. But if you're just trying to tie different ecosystems together, like one tank is seahorses, and then you've got your reef, and then you've got over here your fancy angelfish like I do, and they can all plumb into one sump, you would have different return pumps, but you wanna make sure that the sump can hold all that water. That's the only thing you have to be worried about, besides the nutrient thing I just talked about. So the only two things you have to worry about. Hey, Chris. Made it two weeks in a row. So I just need you to make it for every week for the rest of the year. Then I'll be proud of you. Jam says, did you get the new anemone tank up yet? No, but it is literally like almost gonna happen. <laughs> I need to get this carpet thing out of my situ out of my way. And then it's just a matter of building the stand. And fortunately work-wise, uh, my Pending orders are low. I literally will have the time. But last week, Minion was so moody. Oh my goodness. It just, she would not cooperate. She did not want to cut. I can't imagine even trying to cut out a stand on Minion right now, the way she was acting with the acrylic. She just kept stopping in the middle of cuts. She would go the wrong depth. Uh, I've tried rebooting. I've tried everything. It's just, it's been really moody. I don't know what's going on. But this happens from time to time. And then it just r resolves itself. It's the weirdest thing. So hopefully, things will get back on track and the gremlins will go away. Guonk Reef Keeping just got here. Well, you're almost two hours late. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. Rather Be Traveling says, here's a suggestion. Take a photo of your tank and then label the corals and use that as a back part of the stream. You know, that's I actually bought a special like pen to write on the glass. And I was thinking about doing just that, writing on the front of the glass what each thing is, and then, you know, take a picture, and then I could share that. Or, like you said, put it here on the stream. So that is a possibility we could do. Um, Josh says, I learned a lesson on sponges. Never let them grow on or near your corals. It's not worth it. I had a sponge almost wipe out my basketball-sized splatter hammer, the coral looked fine, but when I pulled it out, it was getting close to choking off about half or two-thirds of the heads of the colony. It had grown over the flesh almost all the way up to the top of the heads. Thank God I caught it when I did. Well, I'm glad you caught it as well. Let's see. Okay, Squid Missile wrote, I, uh, okay, I feel like these, I don't know how you did these in a different order. <laughs> I feel like you started with this one. I set up my 200 gallon a day RODI system. I'm not sure I did it right because I'm not getting very much out of my product line, but my water is pretty cold at 50 degrees. And also wrote, I also did the drinking water tap before the, or after the RO, before the DI, and then I turned on my DI canisters to fill, um, when I turn on my DI canisters, they fill with air. All right, so let's let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about RODI systems. You have cold water right now at 50 degrees, which literally at that number, whatever your system is rated for, like you said, 200 gallons a day, you're going to get 100 gallons a day because the water's so cold. When the water's 76 degrees, you will get 200 gallons a day if your PSI is around 70 and your TDS is less than 200 coming out of the tap. Um, but that's that's other stuff. Doesn't matter right now. What we what matters is what's going on with your product line. So the water coming out for drinking water 
it's going to come out probably in a four to one ratio. So that means for every four gallons of water goes down the drain, you get one gallon of good water. So you can see the drain line, water is really flowing, and your product line that's coming out slowly. Then when you close the RO line to make DI water, it is possible your housings are drained for some reason, and you have to wait for them to fill up completely with water again for water to come out the tube at the end. But it will also be the same rate of speed as the drinking water was. So if it took 16 minutes to make a gallon of RO water, it'll take 16 minutes to make a gallon of DI water. You can't make both at the same time. You have to literally close the valve on the RO to open the valve on the DI. And if you have both valves closed after the DI and the RO and you let the system pressurize, everything stays full of water all the time. But if you turn off the cold water source, then you're going to have housings that drain because water is going out through siphon and you'll end up with like these air pockets. So I like to pressurize my system and let it turn off with the auto shutoff valve, which is the white thing on top with the four tubes. And if you set it up like that and you still want to turn off the cold water line, you can, and that's totally fine. I, I actually prefer to have everything just pressurized and then shut off the water for a safety purpose, just so it can't, you know, suddenly burst a leak and flood the house, uh, especially when I travel. But since I'm here all the time, I tend to just have the line open and I close the output lines. And if that didn't help, uh, come to Club Mueller's Reef and we'll help you over there. Fletcher Wright says, I really appreciate you reminding me about testing your tank. I'm good and bad. <laughs> I'm good about it and I'm bad about it sometimes. Yeah, so, so good to test our water weekly. Um, I'm being spoiled because I have automated testing and ICP testing, so I'm getting those results constantly. But that doesn't mean I don't open up test kits and use them. I literally just picked up a brand new nitrate test kit. I cannot wait to test my water and see where they're at. I have a feeling they'll be just like they have been. I have no reason to doubt the last kit I owned. I think I'm still going to be measuring about 80, but we'll see. I'm going to put in the Fritz 460 today in my tank, and I'm going to turn off the skimmer for two days. So my skimmer will be off tomorrow, and it'll be off on Monday while they're replacing the carpets, which makes sense because as they're peeling up carpets and cleaning the floor underneath, there will be some dust, and I don't need that dust being sucked into the protein skimmer. So it's going to be good that my skimmer will be off at that time. Maybe I'll turn off the skimmer tomorrow and put the 460 in tomorrow. That way it's just off Sunday and Monday, and I can resume it on Tuesday. I had a lot of foundation work done on this house a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And when they did, they pulled up all the carpets, and they literally jackhammered holes through my floors in the bedroom, the hall bathroom, my entire living room. I had three giant holes in my living room floor where they put piers under the slab. And then they swept everything up and the carpet got pushed back down into place. But now they're going to pull out this carpet that I've had in this area since 2014. And then all the bedrooms since probably 2002, 2003. So I'm assuming there'll be a lot of dust that needs to be removed and is going to land on everything I own. <laughs> Even with a boxed up, I'm still going to be dealing with cleaning. So there's no reason to let my protein skimmer suck that in. So it's good the skimmer will be off. <clears throat> Um, you know what? I want to look something up while you guys are on hold. <laughs> Let me open up my browser. I need to show you guys a coral that knocked my socks off. So let me jump on Instagram slash title gardens. I hope that's how they write their name. This coral was sick. All right, I'm going to swipe it from there, save, and is it saving as a JPEG? That's all I care. See, it doesn't want to do that, jerk. All right, hang on. Let me move some boxes out of my way so I can get to this thing. Oh, well, we're just going to have to do it the hard way. We're just going to swipe it. Okay, guys, look at this coral. Now that I've swiped it. Look at this coral! This is a Leptocirrus, apparently. I would think it's a Fabio, to be honest. I don't even know. But they said, at the time when they posted this, and I happened to see it like within minutes, 
the next five people who place an order will get an ultra free Leptosiris. So I don't think it was this thing. I don't, I don't know. Maybe they just caught my attention with this coral, but this coral is amazing. So if you're asking what keeps me interested, it's stuff like this. It is incredible. I love it so much. Those striations. <laughs> it's like puzzle pieces. It's so cool. And if you're listening to the show and you didn't get to see it, sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. That was worth looking at. That thing was amazing. Uh, Squid Missile says, my alkaline has been 15.9 for two months. Everything is super happy. Well, that's the wrong number. So whether it's happy or not, that's that's the wrong range. I um, I can tell you that my tank at one point looked completely normal and my alkaline was 22. Uh, it was a mistake that happened with my calcium reactor and lack of testing. And it took me about three months to get it back down to nine where it belonged. Um, but the goal should not be crazy numbers like 16 DKH. Hobby Dreams Day says, have you experimented with the new AI blades? No, I have not. What do you think about them for a small lagoon type reef that's only 16 inches high? I don't know. I haven't, I have I just know they exist. I have the XHOs. I have my uh, skies. I, I don't need any other lights, and I don't plan to buy some uh, AI blades just to see what they do. You know, if AI wants to send me a pair to try out, I could consider, you know, taking a look at them. I don't mind. I mean, I'm happy to do that. I was reading uh, some comments from Polo Reef. They seem to be blown away with them. They love them. So that might be a good channel to ask. Polo Reef is on everywhere. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And he just posted about them on Facebook recently, or maybe it was Instagram, where he said how he was just blown away by them. Oh, it was in the Polo Reef group on Facebook. So check with him. Michael, uh, he says I was trying to ask, is what can I do to maintain my calcium without raising alkalinity? I'm using Kalkwasser. My alkalinity keeps raising when the calcium is dropping. Keep dosing calcium chloride. Just get calcium additive, and that will bring up the calcium. It's just like me. I've been putting in uh, isolate carbon, uh, isolates carbonate, I think it's called. It's a bottle of calcium. It's liquid calcium. And I've been putting in 20 milliliters a day every day for like the last 14 days to bring up my calcium level higher. My alkaline is staying the same. Rather be traveling says, I don't want black worms growing in my refrigerator. Well, they grow in a bowl. It's just like cheese in your refrigerator that's growing mold. It's not everywhere. It's just on the cheese. Ah, Reefkeeper says, if you can't get blackworms, try Easy Reef's Mastic for the copper band. Mine loves the stuff, and you can smash the pellets, flakes, and frozen into the mastic and get it eating all the other things, too. Good suggestion. Thank you very much, Reefkeeper. Jesus Fish says, I've been listening to you for a while now since your podcast. Whatever happened to that kid you used to podcast with? That would be Evan Luck, and he's still around. hes I don't think he has an aquarium at this time, but uh, he's still a friend. We still chat from time to time on Facebook when we bump into each other, or occasionally we just randomly text each other just to say hey. But um, yeah, he's hes a dad with kids and, and a house, and, uh, and he's working somewhere doing something for money. That's all I know. Lawson Hall says, can you clean the Radeon G5 lights, specifically the fan? Mine is making a lot of noise when the lights get hot, like it's rubbing on something. Yeah, you definitely can. You can kind of sort of disassemble them and clean them pretty well and then put them back together again. It's definitely doable. I would be very cautious to um, not break any wires. And um, you want to maybe use compressed air to like blow out any kind of dust and salt accumulations in there so it looks nice and clean again. Um, Kyle says, have you vacuumed out or dusted the electronics enclosure for Minion? Dust static can make them act funky. Well, I will take a look and see if there's that going on. As far as, you know, I've opened up the, uh, that section before and it just looked like a bunch of circuit boards. Looked fine. But I definitely could do a, a blast of air in there, just like I was telling this guy with his light a second ago. Lawson, it's, it's not wrong to take your light apart. There might even be a tutorial on YouTube showing exactly how it's done. I know that Dwayne used to take his apart every year and, and really clean them, deep clean. 
I was cleaning mine not too long ago and I did some disassembly, no big deal. And I got a lot of stuff out of them and it felt a lot better. And then I ended up upgrading anyway to some newer lights after that. <laughs> uh, Bob says, what would you test weekly? Alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, phosphate, and of course temperature, pH, and ORP are standards for me. Um, yeah, the big four. And then if you can test potassium, if you have a potassium test kit, that would be another good one. But the ICP does it. So really it's just going to be nitrate, phosphate, alkalinity, calcium, magnesium. Those are very important. And of course salinity because you want to make sure you're staying at 35 ppt, which is 1.0265. So if your tank's 1.024, you're a little low. If you're 1.027 or 1.028, you're too high. 1.0265. Atkins says, will my clownfish ever stop biting my hand? Nope. All you can do is leave your hand in there intentionally and just let it do its worst, and maybe it'll figure out that that's not having the reaction that it was expecting and you can um, put band-aids on later. <laughs> Jason says, I'm done and you're still talking. Check the club page. Okay, he must have posted some pictures of a snowman. I can't wait. I guess I'll have to end the live stream so I can go check that out. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I don't need to talk about testing because I just spent time talking about testing just a moment ago, but I would like to throw my little thing on here on the screen. Ta -da. Water test save lives. This is something Caitlin said. She's 100% right. At some point, I will get the t-shirt, and uh, I will be wearing that. But I want to remind you guys that if you don't test the water, you will be the Titanic that just slams into that iceberg, and you're going to have a hard time recovering from it. So instead, be aware of your parameters so you can fix the little tiny things now before they become big things and become expensive things, and you can get to enjoy your tank longer with less drama, and you can enjoy more time with your family and less under the aquarium. I will see you guys again in another week. Bye.